episode 25, Andrew Usher. Welcome to the Oxidative Potential Podcast, where we discuss all things sports science and performance. I'm your host, Matthew DeRoche, and with me is my fellow co-host, Phil Batterson. Enjoy. Good day, folks. In today's episode, I speak with Andrew Usher. Now, Andrew is a pioneer in, in paving the way in what he's doing with uh, sports performance related to combat sports, um, whether that's through the testing and protocols or um, whether that's on the back end and how he's deciphering the data that he's um, collecting. And I really enjoyed this this conversation because one, you know, combat sports is, is like a home to me. Um, I spent a lot of time trying to wrap my head around the, you know, neurological demands, the physiological demands um, of combat sports. And it's a very, very complex and intertwined space. So you'll hear Andrew and I talk about some things that might not really maybe make sense to, you know, people coming from a different background. But um, one thing to kind of take note of is when you're engaging in combat sports, there's a huge psychological component that plays a big role in that and also plays, uh, you know, the ner- the the cognitive component and in, in processing the information also interplays with um, physiology quite extreme. So in this discussion, you'll, you'll hear us talk about tons of different things, whether it's protocols, training, um, you know, different aspects of combat sports that are, are important to kind of wrap your head around. Um, but, uh, you know, this, this was an amazing conversation. I, I loved getting to, to sit down here with Andrew and ask as, as many questions as, as possible surrounding his thoughts on, you know, intervening and, and collecting data. So I'm really excited to share this episode. Andrew's done a ton of great work out there. He's worked with great fighters. Um, he's currently working with Hannah Rank, and she's, she's world champ in, in, in boxing. Also, one of the things, too, is, um, you know, I think 10 years down the road, I think he's really going to change the field that much. So hopefully you guys can glean some of that information a little bit earlier from this podcast on what he's doing and how he's approaching it. Um, and, uh, yeah, if you want to get in touch with Andrew or follow him, or I'll leave links to, to, to his Instagram and, and site and all that stuff in the show notes. Um, and other than that, hope you guys enjoy the episode, which is exciting because I'll probably not, uh, shut up during this conversation, but I'll try my best to, to get in some good questions here because, um, I want to preface this for everyone is what you're measuring with, with boxing and, and fighters is how I think a lot of the field should kind of take notes on in the sense that there's no roadmap for what you're doing and you're literally creating the roadmap and instead of carrying over principles and, and testing protocols and all these things that have had these tight correlations with other things you're saying what actually is the markers that are moving the needle what are the yeah. things that we're seeing inspiring what are the things that we're seeing in training um so i think a lot of people are going to learn from this in terms of how did you get to the process of understanding what moves the needle what are the things that you're looking on on a week to week basis or you know monthly basis um all these different things. So I think it's, I think it's really cool what you're doing. So let's just give a, let's just give a brief introduction of like, how did you get to this point? Like where you're at now, but how did you get there? Um, and, and why are you kind of sinking your teeth in here? Okay. So, um, I, I grew up in the seventies, so I'm, I'm old I'm near the end of the runway. So, and in the seventies, there wasn't a lot of martial, there wasn't really a lot of sports in the East end of Glasgow. So I did boxing and then there was the esoteric martial art of karate. So I did karate for a lot of years. And that's basically the story of my life was always in martial arts, always boxed, always kicked boxed. Um, around about 23, discovered, realized that I was never going to be a, a world title contender. Moved into coaching. 
And then roughly about 35, when we had a straight blast gym, an affiliate training group, SPG for MMA in Scotland, one of the first ones, I suddenly realized that the way we were coaching didn't seem to make any sense from the point of view of results. There was, it was very archaic. It just was very thrown together bits here and there. And everyone was doing everything with good intentions. So it was a, not a case that people were just doing crazy, stupid things. It's just that people didn't know any better. Um, and I was getting really injured from Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I'd get my clavicle dislocated and my shoulder dislocated and all things. And I thought, we need to be doing better than this. And my wife's a doctor. So I'd proxy, you know, run a medical practice with her. And anatomy and physiology has been something that's always been quite fascinating to me. And then I started looking at things. And I started seeing that there was no way to know what was actually occurring in the actual competition phase. So we do all this physical preparation. And we were big into periodization and you know general physical preparation sports specific preparation all that stuff so we had a a blueprint but it wasn't translating to competition so we had some fighters that had some of the worst training regimes on the planet win things and we had athletes with some of the best training regimes the planet lose (laughs) so it didn't seem to stack up we were like fuck none of this makes any sense uh so around 35 i decided to go back to uni uh, because my original degree was computing science and psychology starting back into sports science and then I started to notice that everything was very whole body, you know, systemic function. Everything was VO2 max, cardiac output, stroke volume, all these things, which explained a lot. But there was still a big, big disconnect to me from the point of view of a front kick, had you know, knee flexion extension, hip extension, these things. Something had to drive that. And I was never really convinced that systemic was the only thing driving it, that peripherally something must be occurring. <clears throat> but there was no way to measure it. So for years and years, I've been plugging away with things, looking at heart rate modeling, uh, looking at AI to kind of do mathematical modeling in the back end of heart rate and oxygen kinetics. And just within the last two years, we went deep into the rabbit hole, uh, looking at peripheral. How could we ascertain what localized muscle function was doing? And that led us to the rabbit hole, which is always the nerves, which is a clusterfuck um, <laughs> when you're down there. And that, so, so at that point, we started to see some very interesting things. When we put the moxies on and we had the portamons, a few other things, we started to notice that the physiological response to like pad sessions was very different to bag sessions. So like the muscle would desaturate at different times. Resaturation would occur at different times. The left quad might desaturate slightly later than the right quad. It just was a big mess of things. And then when we put it on for sparring, it was a completely different picture. The muscle desaturated much quicker had a much longer period of homeostasis and then a reset and it was completely different. And then I thought, this is a PhD. This is because we now have an option of actually getting real life physiological data other than heart rate and sparring. And we can probably with the caliber athletes that we have, which are all pretty high level and some of them are world level, world champion level, get real insight into what elite performance looks like versus recreational MMA fighter, recreational amateur boxer, because there's a massive difference and the physiological profile between those two categories of athletes. And that, that was basically it for me. It just was a selfless pursuit of, can we do things better? And can we understand why we're doing them better? Because I'm a big, big person for accountability and things. And, uh, and that's really, and that's led us down this massive rabbit hole of what are we seeing and why are we seeing it? And subsequently, how can we improve performance? Because it's very multifaceted. You know, when you actually look at it, there's a lot of, how SNC is done, how the biomechanics of striking this facility is a massive one, for, especially for, for nerves and looking at oxygen uh, desaturation values, and then just combining it and whether is long steady state running beneficial or not beneficial. And, you know, so basically, I, as I said earlier on, for me, it's like when an athlete, we always say to them, if you have a Ferrari chassis, you need to have a Ferrari engine. There's no point having a four focus engine and a Ferrari chassis and vice versa. So we are all about putting the engine together with the chassis and fine tuning the engine as best it can be. And, and when we do that, we tend to find that we get phenomenal results. But that, to get to that point, is like a real big detective story with the athlete because you've got to work out why things are happening, why they're not happening. And, you know, you have to really like a data-heavy approach. Like some of our athletes absolutely hate it. It's just, yeah. you know, so they, 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 they get a cut-down version of it. Other athletes like Hannah Rankin, uh, current world champion, she loves all this stuff. So it's an easy sell for her, yeah. you know, give her a graph and she'll sit there and go through it with you and tell you what's happening. So for that, so that's, so that's basically it. That's, that's kind of why we did it. 
few things on there. <clears throat> I just want to dig into this right quick. Like, this is something that I've always known is seeing the response from, you know, sparring versus bag work versus pad work. I see it kind of as this hierarchy where, you know, bag work, it's all pre-programmed scripts, right? Mm -hmm. Then you work into pad work where there's a, there's kind of a response that happens where you have a window to perform whatever the task is. And then you have inspiring where that window gets really short and yeah. those scripts and thinking about coordination, you know, the reason why our economy improves in whatever we do with running, cycling, any of these things is because we create heuristics and we have these feed forward mechanisms, right? And whenever you're inspiring those feed and forward mechanisms, you know, they kind of go at the window in a lot of ways. Like, yes, you are going to be performing, you know, some of these instinctual movements that have, you know, you've trained over the years, but is, is that why you're seeing the response? Do you think, is that, is that kind of the basis for the response that you're seeing versus sparring versus bag work? Uh, I think there's a few things there. It's quite a lot. Okay. Uh, one, I think bag work is prescribed probably wrongly most of the time athletes are just coming in and especially in traditional amateur boxing clubs where you go in and there's a timer on it's like hit the bag for three minutes beep move to the next bag yeah. so your athlete is just is, is just throwing shit for the sake of shit a lot of the times um yeah. so it's not programmed right when you move into the pad side of things a lot of that is very dependent and as an athlete got a fight coming up are you technically drilling specific things are you not drilling specific things is it just I'm just going to do pads with this kid over here because he's in the gym. And then sparring is chaos. So sparring is really about becoming comfortable and the uncomfortable. That's, that's that flow state. Yeah. So when I did my master's degree, I looked at the, the I looked at 27 years of amateur boxing because there's nothing in professional boxing. And you start to see some interesting trends. You start to see that the aerobic capacity in regards to VO2 max is, is not that high in a boxer. So it goes from roughly about 42 and a VO2 score right up to about 67 from an SE paper. So most of the boxers we test have a VO2 max between probably 52 and 66.1. So that's not a massive range for anyone compared to endurance, but it's enough. So you start to see that. You start to see that lactate levels post-sparring can be anywhere from 6 millimoles to 24 millimoles. It can be massive. So we know they can. So we know it's got an aerobic and an anaerobic component. Or I don't like those terms personally. <laughs> I kind of go for oxidative and non-oxidative. Um, yeah. So... So we know all that stuff. So, but where the interesting thing becomes prevalent when you put boxes on is that biomechanics is super important because mm -hmm. when our boxer, for example, to put it in perspective, when I first really had the light bulb moment, we had two athletes at a very high level spa and we had moxie on both of them. I was live watching the sparring session and I, I could notice that one of the lads was really struggling in the back leg. Like he's just, he was just desaturating. It was like, it was as if it was, if it was like a massive muscular compression on his quad. It just was, like, <laughs> and, and he just was not resaturating in the recovery. The 60 seconds, it was very, very borderline recovery. Look at his heart rate. There was a bit of cardiac drift. He wasn't recovering at all. So I said to the other kid, I said, I just want you to clinch him in the next round. And the, the other kid's like, I don't like clinching. Don't like clinching. I'll just take him to the corner every now and again and just lean heavy on him. And that kid struggled. The other kid struggled to get this kid off of him. And then we just watched it. He just deteriorated round by round. There was absolutely no recovery at all at that point. And then we just had the other kid beat him up for the last three rounds. <laughs> and, uh, and win this kind of basically win that spell. There's not really winning in sparring, it's a tool. But it showed us that we could use Moxie live to see what was happening locally. And for us, that's, that's the key. Because we know these kids are going to hit a peak maximum heart rate, they're going to peak, right? they, yeah. they, the kind of heart rate connects is going to come up pretty fast in sparring, so they'll hit maybe 184, 185. So we know that's not an issue. We know these kids are conditioned enough to last the rounds. So what's the differential between sparring partner A and B? It's the ability to recover. Yeah. So for us, everything went into recovery modeling with nurse. We look at everything. So we're looking at when is the muscle desaturating in the round? How, how is it stabilizing and what the resaturation is? And I think that is the key. And going back to the question, I think the problem we have is, is that bags and pad work are so dissimilar to each other and are even more dissimilar to sparring yeah. that we're not training them for the ultimate expression, which is competition. Yeah. So in my gym, and I'm very lucky what with David McAllister in Aberdeen, and he's he's been very open to listening to my ramblings and, and the shit that I talk. 
he's so we now do very targeted bag work so we have very heart almost like heart rate zone derivative but they're actually more nurse derivative bag sessions so that everyone's very very targeted and pad work is very targeted also and now we're seeing that all that is transferring really nicely into sparring so we're seeing much much more we're seeing a much quicker desaturation and a much quicker resaturation the curves are nice the linear regressions are good and generally the athletes are getting fitter faster which is kind of interesting because it goes against all the snc that we did for, <laughs> for years and years um so we're actually more c and less s now we actually think it should be called conditioning and strength trial and strength and condition. I joke about that to fourth year students. Uh, yeah. it, annoys, it annoys the S and C students when I say that. But we think conditioning is the key for we think boxing, like most combat sports, is an endurance sport yeah. more than more than anything else. Your ability to get yes. through those rounds. Because yeah. if you think about it, how many fights actually end up in a real classy knockout? Very few. Which is why they're spectacular when they happen. But most will go to a decision. Yeah. So when you play the statistics game. You want your athlete to get to the end of the round, so you want that 36 minutes or, or 25 minutes or whatever it is you're doing. So so I think that's for us has been, been the difference. It's really just been able to identify what's occurring. And I think pads and bags are skills that are overused and probably probably not regulated or periodized or planned probably as well as they should be. Yeah. That's... Uh... <clears throat> that brings to my head is like there's so many things like i just everything you say i just want to drift <laughs> off on like a two-hour conversation but it, it's funny because what i see in, in mma and boxing is there's so much dogma carried over and there's no specific targeting training what you're talking about is exactly true because it's like watching a cyclist train in a zone three maybe let's just call it out of a five yep. zone model yep that has no relevance to, to their fighting has like the worst physiological cost to it right yeah and yeah. when they overburden that there's very little uh you know actual adaptation from that because they're essentially overtraining this one zone versus like you know this very specific targeted approach and also building the physiology that underlies the performance and the one thing that i i, I do note is you know whether it's it's a lot of the work that's done is just mindless. It's a checkbox. Like, yeah. You know what I mean? Like you see yeah, people yeah, out yeah. there and they're just checking the box. There's no actual mental effort being put into anything that's being done. It's just moving the body. And then the other thing that I was thinking about there when you're talking about an endurance sport is I think there's a misconception a lot of the times in fighting that when they go to strength and conditioning, they're trying to chase, you know, speed and power and these things. And it's like the actual amount of speed and power you're going to gain at the beginning of the fight, like that you're pretty close to your genetic limit. You're not going to push those things. It's having the physicality for longer in the fight, right? If you can still yeah. push your physicality in round eight, that's what matters. Cause everyone's coming out cracking in the first three rounds, right? And the yep. same with MMA, like anyone can punch hard in the first round. It's, it's not about that. It's about imposing that physicality for longer. So that kind of puts you probably in the minority of people then um, that believe that, which is, I, and I agree with you. I think that's what it is because when athletes come in, they want to be stronger. Yeah. You have to ask them, well, what is strength? What is power? You know, what, you know, what are what? What are these things? Because we just did a conference on this and we were like, you know, we were asking strength condition coaches to explain to us what is strength physiologically, what is power physiologically, what is post-activation potentialization, what are yeah. these things physiologically, and very few could actually convey it. Yeah. So we're like, well, if you don't understand the underpinning physiology behind what you're trying to achieve, what exactly are you achieving? You know, yeah. like so, some bugbears that I have is we have world-class undisputed athletes come in who have SNC coaches that think they're doing the right thing, and they, you know, it's no harm to them but are obsessed with things like counter movement jumps. And, and I'm like, well, you know, and you've got athletes coming in that are basically, we now call it the ballerina syndrome, where they come in and because all they want to do is impress you on a counter movement jump, leap into the air and flip the legs like a ballerina. And you're like, what the fuck are you doing? Uh, and they're like, oh, uh, you know, so these kids are trying to, to, to pass a test without actually understanding what the test is actually there to try and show. Yeah. So, we've got that issue and then 
we've got this whole idea, well, we are doing line mine pressing and a lot of things, high volume that are changing biomechanics because when you punch, you're not punching unless your fight's on tour. Yes. You tend to not be going in that direction, right? So, yeah. so just from the kinematics, you're changing certain structures. Yeah. Um, so we see that quite a lot. And our approach is completely different. Our approach more is, is, you know, that whole idea, well, we need to test you. So my whole process is quite straightforward. You come to see me. The first thing we do is a movement assessment. Mm. And this has been something that we have gleaned over years of attending all sorts of movement assessment things. We've attended functional movement screen courses, which mm. I didn't think was particularly great. Uh, some of the best courses ever attended was Mike Reinhold's Integrative Movement Assessment is quite a good course. We took some of that. We took some of uh, Andy Lemon and, and Stephen from Australia's Mac course. And we basically pieced together in the 3D motion capture suite a set of tools to look at assessment screen combat athletes. So we look at just simple things like uh, actually the actual movement assessment is basically a con. What I'm actually, I'm not really interested. So basically what I should explain is I'm interested in what compensations does someone make mm -hmm. to try and pass the test? Because most athletes have S&C coaches. So yeah. when I ask them to do a lunge and they know it's a test, they're going to try and pass this test. So mm -hmm. their body's going to make a compensation to make the test. So I, that's what I look for. So when I'm scoring the movement, I say, well, I don't give a shit whether they can touch the floor with both their hands. I'm just interested in the, how do they go about the process of touching the floor? Yeah. Is the hips coming back? Are the hip hiking? Same with squatting. Then you know I'm looking for something. So I look at, is the hip pelvis position changing? Are they dropping? Are they got a little bit of internal, external rotation? So this is the first thing we do all athletes. Yeah. Once we get that data, we then do our physiology testing. So then we start doing wing gates, upper lowers, incremental treadmill tests, um, but we don't do VO2 now. Yeah. So we just use Moxie because we think we get better data from the Moxie on the incremental. Yeah. And then from that is when we piece it all together and we go, you know, because if, if an athlete is squatting really poorly and there's a lot of asymmetry and then they do a wing gate and we see a drop off in power left and right leg, then we can back that up and say, right, definitely something's there because combat sports are asymmetrical. Anyway, there is going to be asymmetry. Uh, one of the things that I think quite interesting, I'm going to a tangent now. Um, where, where athletes says, a lot of SNC coaches are trying to make them super symmetrical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So they spend a lot of time yeah. making people super symmetrical and not realizing yeah. just how the natural body pushes, you know, how the back foot pushes for you through yeah. your back hand. So we our rule is, is, unless you're like between 11 and 15% asymmetry, we don't really give a shit about it too much. Yeah. As long as your wing gates are good, your, you know, your strength test is good, your isokinetic test is good, the force plate, power punch looks good so when we have an athlete we're basically saying let's stop chasing strength stop chasing power and let's just get to the nitty gritty we need you to last these rounds do you have the mitochondrial capacity to last those rounds and if you don't we're going to fix it yeah. and that's going to involve just sprint training and a whole heap of other type of training and we're going to measure it and that's the key for us is we 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 are we are very data heavy uh so we measure everything so I'll give you protocols. You'll take a heart rate monitor. I'll sync it all up so I can see it remotely. If I can, I'll give you Moxie data. And I'll get that via the VO2 master cloud app now mm. remotely. And we process everything in the back end. So we get scripts that do all of it now. So, so that's, that's our take. But you are in the minority in the sense that, and I think you're right, you have what you have genetically. Yeah. How much can you manipulate it? And a lot yeah. of the issues are just probably misaligned training protocols. People are just yeah. not training appropriately for the sport. Because they think, because you think about it, why do athletes do long runs? It's weight management. That traditionally yeah. it was just weight management. That's yeah. all it was. So we we are very strict on that as well. We don't like athletes. So I'm a five percenter. I don't like athletes to be five percent out with fight weight at any time. Davy, who I work with, like seven percent. So we're kind of close. Um, so we can agree to disagree. But we don't like athletes to bounce out of weight. We like athletes to be thinking more fifty-two weeks a year rather than eight-week camp. 10 week camp, take six weeks off, come back, yeah. back camp, get rid of it, slide them into performance. So our athletes, especially elite level, are training all the time. So we're constantly evaluating where are they, you know, what they're pushing. Um, can we squeeze some extra things here? Do you have to rein back a little bit here? So it's like it's just like a sliding scale. It's just constant sliding scale on the board of, you know, we have got set things we do beginning of the week just to assess where they are, which is very like how Team GB do it in a run. So, so things like that, but yeah, you're in the minority there, which is good. One, one thing on that is well, a few things there. <clears throat> one, when athletes are training for strength, 
it's not strength. That's the one thing I see is like, first of yeah. all, you're, you're not training strength. Strength is, you know, a maximal effort and a 15 minute rest. You're not doing that. No one has the time for that. Nope. A lot of the times people are training conditioning. The other time, the other thing on that um, is what I see with SNC, the big problem is, is this, they're trying to, th this old pattern, and I see it all the time, and it fucking destroyed me, and I've seen it destroy so many other people, is they want this global effort versus a coordinated effort. And what I mean by global effort is they want, this is, this is the strength and conditioning coach's mindset, is we want all your motor units firing to make that movement as simple as possible, right? Yeah. And it's just, I see coordination go out the window. I see fighters get stiffer. I see coordination start deteriorating dramatically. And we know this from cycling and running all these different things is like those people that a lot of the people that have the best endurance are cycling motor units and they're very efficient in how they apply those motor units yeah. in coordinated fashion. So that's the, that's one other thing. The other thing I, I see too is like, you're right with this whole five to seven uh, percent of body weight within that range. I like, I ask people when they're talking about weight, everyone's like, Oh, you got a weight advantage. Look, I've cut, you know, 50 plus pounds in, in for fights. I, I can tell you there's no advantage. First of all, all that strength and conditioning work that people are doing, you're the, the whole point of that. One of them <laughs> is to raise the plasma volume, train yeah. the, 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 the vagal or the, um, the vascular response train, the mitochondrial capacity. When you go and dehydrate yourself by 10 to 15%, I'm sure you're on my point on this is oh yeah yeah throw yeah. all that out the window. You just yeah. literally waste that. Do you, I've been do saying you this. see that? Yeah. I've been saying this for years and yeah. you know, and I've had some interesting discussions with people lately about this. I don't understand if you, if you're fighting say 69 kilos, at super well weight. You should not be doing your SNC at 85 kilos and then cutting it. And because I, I can tell you, and I, I'm, I can't mention names, but we have had some of the best athletes on the planet in our labs who have fallen into that cutting, you know, massive amount of weight in the last week who yeah. have done exceptionally poorly and very lucky to still be at world champion level. Yeah. And you explain to them, you are training at a weight class that's maybe three above where you're going to fight. So there is no size advantage for you because the only way you can get there is to dehydrate. Yeah. You know, and then you start to get issues with kind of muscle contractile, you get issues with calcium kind of sensitivity levels and sarcoplasmic reticulum and all that good stuff. It's not yeah. going to fire. Yeah. And it's a challenge because there is a size advantage. See, I think the argument a lot of people have with me is, is yeah, yeah, but in, in MMA it's different. Boxing, maybe not, but in MMA, that extra weight. And I think that's maybe true if somebody falls on top of you. You know, yeah. and they're like maybe 60 pounds heavier than you, like in BGJ yeah. or whatever, right? So I think, yeah. yeah, but maybe, but it's different when they're being, when then you're kind of clubbing them, you know? Yeah. It, so yeah. I, I don't believe in it. Don't believe in size advantage necessarily. Yeah. I think Canelo is a good example. Canelo's not massive for his weight class, yeah. you know, but he's got skill, timing, and he's come on leaps and bounds. So yeah, I'm totally agree with you. It, it, it breaks my heart that you have these kids where you're doing as much as you can from physiologically, and you have to say to them, cutting this weight, you're negating eight weeks of preparation. Yeah. Come in to see me, 5%, and all your SNC, your muscle fiber recruitment, everything is bang on the money. And on yeah. the night, you're just going to be fighting like you train. You're going to have that advantage of recovery. And the recovery goes out the window. That's when you start looking at heart rate kinetics, when people dehydrate, and we don't have any papers on this, but it's something we're looking at. When you look at how the heart rate recovers between round dehydrated, there's the slow phase and fast phase recovery changes dramatically. You start yeah. to see a much slower response to recovery. It's becomes near the end of the round. So what happens is it's about probably four or five seconds before they actually go back into the next round that they actually start to come down in a heart rate and then it goes straight back up. And cardiac drift starts to get really crazy. And you, We've got enough data to show this. You can start to see it versus a hydrated fighter. You see a different picture where they start to recover much earlier in the round and they have a little bit maybe a cardiac drift depending on how good their condition is in the later rounds where it's nowhere near as severe yeah. so we know that the kinetics changes quite dramatically and we're seeing this in the o2 kinetics as well we're definitely seeing muscle saturation change versus hydrated and dehydrated in fact we're about to do a research project on that um fairly soon we're going to look at heat and how it affects dehydration values affects that so we know it's there but yeah. they still do it they're still athletes still you know, it, it's, I'm lucky that I only have a couple of 
athletes that we have kind of slight issues with the weight that they kind of bounce a little bit, but generally it comes back under control. But you would be shocked at the elite of elites, how out of control it can be. And you're just like, and a lot of this is because the SNC coach doesn't know how to deal with it. And they don't speak to nutritionists. A lot of times the nutritionist is not qualified. It's maybe something that's on a weekend course on water loading. It's, yeah. just, it's, it's, just, it's just horrific. You know, it's just, yeah. you know, I said certain things. Some of us are trying to do a good job and some of us are just trying to do a job so we can have Instagram. Yeah. And, um, and I hate socials. I'm, I'm got about six followers or something. So I'm not a social <laughs> person. I hate it. <laughs> it's the yeah, most depressing yeah. thing on the planet at times. Um, so, so yeah, but you're right. I mean, I, I don't know how you combat that though. I, I mean, you can educate people as much as you want, but yeah, they just, I think it's, I think personally, um, it's greedy promoters that want to force kids into weight categories. And I know that's yeah. from boxing because I've seen it firsthand. They try to force them to be at a weight category, like bantam weight rather, or super bantam weight rather than where they should be, just because they think they've got a higher chance of success in that weight category. Yeah. But, but we've even seen it doing, you know, rest of the metabolic rate, that you start to see some scary things happen through the camp. Yeah. You know, we've had athletes come in that should roughly have an RMR of two, three, maybe 2,300 to 2,500 coming in at 1,100. And you're like, and they're not losing weight. And the coaching staff don't understand why they're not losing weight. They don't understand why, you know, and you're like, well, you're prescribing 1,600 calories a day with a 2,000 deficit and then sort of some sort of red scenario. So I think it comes back to this thing. I think a lot of coaches are doing the best they can do with the knowledge that they have. Yeah. But it's not good enough, yeah. in my opinion. Though it's not good enough. I'm. Uh, I've wanted to make a campaign for this, or at least because I know there is an attempt in one FC to try and rule this out. Yeah. So you're fighting weight, right? Matt Hume is is a smart guy. But the thing about one of the big things is it even outside of the actual. Let's just talk about classical phy- physiology. Talking about the brain so we we know with the hydration status it takes after that type of severe hydration it takes two weeks to re, re fully hydrate the spinal column and the brain fluid what do you think that does for your neurological performance your cognitive performance and i just i wish i wish fighters could have a panel of tests i wish especially at the beginning of their career put them through test them before put them through a weight cut on cognitive tests you know do run the whole panel before and after and show them this is what you're going to be dealing with so do you want to train this hard for this long to literally throw all that out the window and be stuck at square one again or even worse um it just it drives me up the wall and especially when we're talking about a sport where you know the neurological consequences are going to be amplified and i think that's why we're seeing what we're seeing nowadays with some of these kids ending up in the hospital it's like the amount of weight a lot of these people cutting like you're you, you have to, there's a balance to be found. And I think what you're, you're talking about five to 7% is like, it's right on the money. And I wish more coaches would look that way. Um, it's, it's funny because a local MMA promoter got into a, a debate with me about this. And he was like, you know, well, how can you combat this? Uh, and my PhD supervisor, John, his big thing is, is at the very least, you could buy or hire a reasonable set of Tanita skills and check body water composition and have a rough idea of water and if it's under a percentage they can't fight and the mma promoters get very upset about that because they're like oh we'd be pulling fighters left right and center and i said so you know you have a problem then if that's your reply to me and they were like be too costly and i'm like well i could bring a set in tomorrow if you wanted for your show and he just was like no 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 no." so they're aware of it they just you know and and I, i say this to every young athlete that comes into us to the labs a lot of times they'll bring their family, their girlfriend, their wife. And I'll always say, my job really is more to make sure that you have a, a life out with the sport. Yeah. And they, they just look at you sometimes and the girlfriend, the wife might get it, or the boyfriend might get it. But you're like, because at the end of the day, you're going to leave this sport and transition into normal life. Yeah. Do you want to have children? Do you want to have a healthy, functional life? Do you want yeah. to be able to move? Because, I mean, I'm riddled with like, avulsions and broken toys and it's my head yeah. missing from the old days where we had nothing yeah and i understand that fighters because i was like that myself you, you don't listen but that's why you have coaching staff the coaching staff yeah. are meant to be there to make sure you're safe yeah and i've seen some very in the years in this sport i've been in this sport for over 20 years 
seen some very very sketchy things very yeah. sketchy where you're just oh, like yes. come on yeah but we need to check but i i do feel i'm kind of we're very lucky at Aberdeen University because the university has made combat sports its central research focused. So yeah. we are basically now that's okay. the route we're going down. And we're kind of hoping that some of our third and fourth years as they come through, or maybe want to do research projects in this area. And we're kind of hoping we can start to really bring up a lot more research papers, looking at things. I think as much as weight cutting is super important, I think we need research in other areas just because I think once you interest people in other areas, there's a yeah. good chance to look at the other research. Yeah. I think because research has been very weight cutting heavy, people are very off put by it now. They don't want to read it because they think, oh, we know enough yeah, about yeah. this. Yeah. So my thought process is that we can kind of come in through different angles and probably as, as much as I hate to say it, strength and condition is probably one area where people are quite interested in research. Yeah. If we can get people in through that way to look at kind of maybe more uh, integrative physiology approach or whatever, we may be able to turn that around a little bit. Um, but But generally the research out there is not of a particularly good standard either. Um, I mean, if you look at amateur boxing over the years, and I, I, I looked at that and did a systematic review and stuff, when you look at it, it's very, and this is the it cracks me up the most, but the last 27 years of boxing physiology has been, is boxing 80% aerobic, 20% anaerobic? <laughs> I'm not joking, I do presentations no, I, all the time. Or is it the other yeah. way around? Yeah, You're yeah, like, yeah. no, right. And so how did they ascertain this? Yeah. A graded exercise test, that's your aerobic capacity. And the yeah. lactate off of that is your anaerobic capacity. And that's how people have made this argument. And then when you look at portable like Cosmeds, uh, or rather the K4B or the K5 uh, gas exchange, yeah. and the, then when you look at that, and I've done these tests myself, um, you start to see that it's very difficult. Like you were saying earlier, you, it's, you become very simulated. It's very role playing then, you know, because you then have to hit certain jabs and crosses. Yeah. And I was going to do a PhD looking at substrate utilization. That was going to be the thing until I ran a pilot test. And I saw what I thought I was going to see was that intensity drives substrate utilization. Early rounds, predominantly fat oxidization. Later rounds, predominantly carbohydrates. So yeah. I was kind of like, there's nothing there. But the interesting thing was I had the moxie on all these boxers whilst doing it because we just capture everything. And I looked at that and that was the big moment for me. I looked and I thought, whoa, you know, we know this is happening systemically probably in the whole body. But why the hell is the left quadricep and the right quadricep desaturating at different time points and at different heart rate points? Why would, why would that be the case? And we're still trying to work that out. And at that point, I thought the boxing world is, and research is, is targeted a certain like tunnel because it's easy to do, right? Yeah. So at Aberté, we are heavy in applied science. We're very, very big on it. We understand that that's a probably lower scoring research paper because it's not going to have the same rigors necessarily as a lab-based paper so we yeah. kind of do the best of both worlds so half of my research is very much in the field bags pads spar and moxie the other half of the research is very controlled in the lab and yeah. the, it's to look and show that lab's great research is good but sometimes it doesn't actually balance out into the real world and there's a whole heap of different factors yeah. you know because one of the interesting things about sparring is if you look at the amount of punches thrown in the bags and the pads, the volume's pretty high. Yeah. Sparring, it's between 50 and 80 punches per round, but there's a, a bigger drive of desaturation and there's a bigger delay, which has to be hormonal. Yeah. There has to be, yeah. you know, probably adrenaline, cortisol and all these things happening. So even that has its challenges because when you look at that data, you have to kind of put it in perspective to the other two because although the volume of work is less, probably the hormonal drive is much higher. So there's changes in the glycolysis and all heap of other things. So you see a, a vastly different process, yeah. which for us has been good because we now do carbohydrate fueling very close to the fight um, yeah. and stuff. And we do warm ups much more reduced. And uh, we, do, we don't do crazy warm ups anymore. We just want on kinetics, super fast in the round. Um, so a good example, Hannah Rankin's last uh, world title defense fight one of the big discussions I had was the national anthems. Cause I was like, there's absolutely no fucking point doing a warm up to listen to 20 minutes of bagpipes followed by 20 minutes of Mexican music for an anthem. I said, because your warm up has just disappeared. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so we right. actually made them, we actually made them do the national anthems before we came out. So that yeah. way we could get the warm up. But I'm not a big massive lover of long protracted warm-ups. I think warm-ups is a sketchy thing in its own right. Yes. I think, um, so I'm not a massive lover of them. Because we will do wing gates in the lab without warming up. 
Yeah. Mm. And we can produce some pretty nice power, even as old crumblies. We, we're not too oh, shabby on wing gates. So we don't need to warm up necessarily. I can do like 10 key runs, 45 minutes without a warm up, you know, as yeah. a fat pensioner. So I think yeah. there's a, a d- debate about that, but I think it's I think it's difficult. I love combat sports. I love the research, but there are days I could just stab myself repeatedly because I think, why am I doing this? It's so, because it's like you said earlier, there's no roadmap for me. So I can't sit and refer. I can't sit and look at, you know, other papers and go, okay, that makes sense. That relates across the VO2 relates across because it doesn't. It's it's completely different. We don't. The response is 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 vastly different. Although fascinatingly, um, the point. So we are seeing that there's like an eight second delay in sparring before rapid desaturation occurs on muscle. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what the weight class is. It's there. So interestingly, the weight of the athlete from the point of view of when the muscle will desaturate doesn't seem to change too much, um, which is kind of interesting. That was an interesting one. And the other interesting thing is we've discovered with boxers is when we do isokinetic strength testing is, which is no real surprise to me, is the arms are always stronger than the legs, which is kind of interesting because it probably reinforces that whole thing that they don't really train their legs yeah. particularly too well because yeah. they don't like to squat. So, so yeah, there's a lot there. I went on a tangent there, sorry. (laughs) No, no, there was tons of good stuff in there. One thing that you brought up was the, you know, endocrine response. And that's something I've thought about quite a lot is especially with fighting, you have these mechanisms that are engaging hormonal responses compared to when we see in an exercise test, you get the norepinephrine washout around VT2. So that starts to create mechanisms, you know, surrounding that engaging right like versus where you're having these endocrine responses that are kind of steering physiology in a sense right which is super interesting and i think one of the big reasons i don't think a lot of people have connected you know you know some of the cardiovascular responses is a lot to managing those endocrine responses and i think if you watch boxers from excuse me from the 1930s 1940s to boxers in the 2000s there's a completely different psychological um display going on in the ring which is going to completely change the endocrine response and also for example if you watch someone from thailand sparring versus someone from north america you know what i mean it's too different there's a different approach to you know the psychology the physicality um and i think that's why you see someone in thailand that's you know, drinking a six pack a day and smoking cigarettes in between rounds can easily, you know, hold that physicality through the rounds is because of their psychology and also their physical response. Like you see the the nature of of the the physicality of their caring. They're relaxed. They're completely in, in the positions that they need to be. They're not trying to catch up where you see this kind of tension held in a lot of these North American fighters, European fighters. Yeah. That's they're, they're, they're too late to respond. They're trying to catch up all the time. And it's, it's digging deeper into that physiology. Um, yeah. I mean, this, this is one of the interesting parts of what we're trying to do because we have athletes as they come in that fail every test on mankind, but undisputed world champions. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, that can pull out the bag because they just have this vast amount of ability, self-belief, and they just yeah. know when to throw the hands at the right time. Yeah. And then you have the athlete that maybe is not as good a level that, but has great physicality, great VO2, yeah. great kind of response mechanisms, and, and, and is not as good. Yeah. And and so the, the so the argument against what we do a lot is, well, does it really make a difference? Yeah. And my answer always is, uh, it does if it's done right, because just think about how good those undisputed would be yeah. if they were doing the right training. But the hormonal drive and the endocrine function is funny because I fought Muay Thai as a kid and I remember kind of being first time in Thailand sparring and I just went a little bit too heavy and uh, and they got uh, beaten up for like seven days and so I learned that he did not spar nearly as hard as he sparred in Scotland and it was an education and uh, you're right. I think when you have like real world-class athletes coming out, there's a, you can do as much physical prep as you want but then you have there's a couple of things that annoy me about the sport. One is the preparation doesn't end when that athlete steps in the dressing room because you still have to make sure that when they come out the dressing room for special world title fights, they are still ready to go. 
Yeah. And there is a place, and I'm not a massive, I mean, I'm a qualified nutritionist, but I'm not massive. I think nutrition gets made way over complicated by nutritionists because it's an easy way to make money. So I've just said that probably now. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think nutrition is pretty straightforward. I don't do a lot of nutritional intervention for athletes because most of them are pretty well controlled. But where I do do it is in the dressing room, pre-fight. That's the timing of the carbohydrates to kind of offset mm. adrenaline spikes and, and dumps. Mm. Um, mm. And then it's then it's kind of just having a good team that know how to control the fighter through the rounds. So, mm. so a lot. If I'm in the corner with some of these athletes, with, with good coaches like Hannah's coach, Noel Callan, he'll just look to me and so, "What's your feedback for the round?" And I may just say she needs to back off a little bit this round, or she mm. needs to she can push the pace because my job in the corner at that point is to feedback biomechanics and kind of physiology data to him. So I can say she can go harder, ease it back a little bit, step off the brakes a little bit. Or I can just see in the corner, is she kind of fatiguing a little bit or does she mentally? It's never happened to Hannah since I've been involved in the camp. She's been pretty good. But she's a great team. That's how this team works. You know, you get Rich Williams, you get Rich Farron there doing the cuts. We work as an amazing team and it's just bouncing things. Rich sees something technically, I see something physiologically. It gets fed back. And it gets delivered. And then you have the other issue, which is post fight, where they come out, the cut man's maybe done the work in the hematoma. That's as much as they do. Mm -hmm. So normally at that point, I'll end up working the hematoma and, and work all that, that side of it as well, because you have to make sure you're coming at the other side as good as you did when you came in. But the sport's not like that. You know, I joke about this, you know, and Hannah, <laughs> it's kind of the Fender World title. Everyone's left the dressing room to the after party, and we've got the hump belts and gauze kits and everything to the hotel before we go to the after party it doesn't stop after that fight you've got to debrief it you've got to make sure she's okay we had the incident obviously unfortunately in hannah's last fight she's well documented that her opponent basically went in and just coma for 10 days so we seen that firsthand that you know i'm not we don't have any rationale why it occurred i, I can just give my opinion which was i felt looking at alexander and the scale she looked very dry yeah. so that's just, never, i've seen that too every time i've seen that it's the same so thing. but that's just speculation on my part because nothing's come out from her camp as but you know but then you've got the other issue you've got is hannah going to be okay with the fact that her opponent is is critical care and then in just coma um so it, it's a very mucky sport but <clears throat> you know but the, the thing that's always going to happen is some snc coach and nutritionist is going to take all the claim to fame um mm. once that fight's been won that that's the thing about the sport i hate the most is you don't see anyone until suddenly they've got the belts and then some nutritionist bloke that did an online course is taking all the credit for all the hard work whereas the athlete has done all the hard work it's gonna mm. you know so it's, uh, it is it is crazy but we are getting a better grasp on the physiology of what's occurring and it is allowing us much better preparation on the build up to fight night which is which has been really good but like Hannah, we can sit, we can look at our, we know our vitals, we know, you know, we can put a moxie on on the dressing room and baseline that now because we know what our starting levels are. Yeah. And one of the most amazing things about moxie is biofeedback. So we, <clears throat> if you have an athlete that's very conscious of data, so for example, when Hannah's sparring, she'll come to the to come to the corner and I can look at it and just show the chart and go plenty in the tank. Yeah. And psychologically, she's just like, I'm good to go. Or I can look at it and go, resaturation is maybe not been as good as I like this round, and maybe heart rate recovery is not as much as nice. And I can just say, I'll oh, just, you know, just technical this round, just step back a little bit, work your distance, keep the center of the ring, back away. And for us, it's been a phenomenal tool from that perspective, by psychologically and probably from a biofeedback point of view. We're using it, and there's a lot for that now, which is a big surprise to me. That's something that I think Moxie has huge application for is you know, nears in general is, is basically understanding the readiness of an athlete, yeah. whether that's inter workout or, you know, pre-workout, whatever that is. <clears throat> the other thing that you talked on is warm up. This is something I've, I've been a huge, I've been screaming this from the rooftops for years. And I've always been this guy where coaches are trying to force me to warm up the yeah. whole endocrine response the whole point of adrenaline is to make your body ready and i'm not saying that mark <laughs> burnley, i'm not saying mark burnley and those guys aren't on to things with vo2 kinetics and those things yeah. right we we obviously know that you know blowing out some blowing out some lines pre pre-training or, or pre-race is you know going to create a slightly faster uptake response but 
I think that's different when we're talking about fighting when yes. fighters are yes. at a psychological almost breaking limit before they even start the fight. Yeah. I think that yeah. warming up just a lot of the times for me, I notice every time I've warmed up, I would just make way too much. I think psychologically it put me in the worst place and any fight yeah. that I've warmed up for, it's put me in a horrible place. I never performed well. My worst performances were 100% correlated to my warm up. And if I could just, I literally, the fights where I could just sit there, uh, you know, and, and joke around with, with the coaches when it's my time to go up, you know, I, I bend my knees a couple of times, touch my toes and walk out. Yeah, um, yeah. That's when I've always performed the best because I think the, when it comes to fighting, I think the body is much more intelligent at preparing the athlete. And I think that, you know, the brain is, is well <coughs> capable of preparing the athlete to get out there and, and, you know, perform. Yeah. And I'm not saying that everyone has to do it that way. I'm just saying, listen to the athlete. If the, if the warm up is taking away, you know, take that into so, consideration. Um, this is like music because I, I, um, I totally agree. <laughs> um, yes. I never warmed up. <clears throat> As a kid, yeah. I was forced to warm up. Uh, even when I did uh, box on test of that, I never warmed up. And that's a kind of very pretty kicking style, though I was never that pretty, but um, I never warmed up. Um, we do all our wing gates, all our grade X I test, nobody warms up. Yeah. They go dry. We've never had an issue ever. Um, yeah. If an athlete comes to us uh, and has a pre designed workout that they believe works for them, as long as it's not physically taking too much out of them, I don't have an issue with it. They can do what they want. Yeah. I would just recommend that I don't personally believe it works. Yeah. So I, I, I just don't worry about it. Uh, I think you're right. I think, especially at competition level, as soon as you get near that ring, everything's kicking in place, adrenaline's kicking, cortisol. Yes. It's all just going, right? So, yeah. the, the on, so when you look at the research, especially the amateur research, and you look at peak heart rate on tests and different... It's all run about high 180s for a lot of these kids. You know, that's right through from pretty much senior level to Olympic level. So we, we know the kinetics, the on kinetics for the heart rate is going to be it's going to be pretty sound. It's not yeah. it's because that natural kind of fight or flight mechanism and everything else kicking in. So I don't think we need to do anything. To, a lot of times I'm trying to, I don't want to encourage it any more than it's naturally going to happen. Yeah. So I don't want crazy pad sessions. I don't want, I like just athletes just to be kind of just chilled out, listen to some music, just relax. Yes. I'll be like, here, take a carbohydrate bar. Let's go. Let's rock yeah. and roll. Let's make it happen. Because yeah. they've done it so many. I mean, we are lucky, though, because it's all the athletes. So they've done it so many times before. They know how to fight. Yeah. So it's just now about the proper lead up. But a few of the fighters who have changed the whole build up. A lot of them that have been a lot more successful said, this is a much better way to do it for me. Because yeah. a lot of times they don't want to hit the pads, they don't want to do a warm up, but they feel they're forced into it by S and C coaches. Like you need to do this, you need to do this. And I'm like, why are we doing plyometrics before we walk into a ring? They're not, they're not long jumpers, not they're not hurdling anything. So why, you know, Getting why the tendons doing, ready? Uh, yeah, like straight leg yeah. plyos. I'm like, why are we doing these things? And it's a hard sell a lot of times when I come into camps because the first thing I'll do is I'll take that away, and the S and C coach should be like, but I won't get filmed on television doing my warm up. Um, I'm like, I don't give a fuck about your warm up. Um, I'm only interested in will this athlete win this this fight? That's all we care about. Never mind you. Um, yeah. But I've seen athletes do like 55 minutes of warm ups. I'm like, that's a fucking workout. It's not yeah. a warm up. Um, yeah. So I'm not a. I've done enough research looking into warm ups to see that I don't think there's a massive amount there physiologically. I think yeah. there's a lot of spurious terms being thrown around, like pat yeah. and all that stuff. You know, like the ramp what calls a Jeffries, which are you know, I'll say it again because I've said many times, I think it was quite an original article that he wrote was interesting, but it's quite self-indulgent. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I feel that that's led the UKSCA to adopt a process that I think really, when you dive into the research, is a bit sketchy. Um, mm -hmm. You know, especially look at post-activation potentialization, you think, well, was that really what it was meant to be? I think Andy Gilpin's done some nice posts and, and, and debunking all that stuff as well. So I think everything has its place, but I think yeah. you've got to use your tools wisely. And I think yeah. more often than not, you know, we are very minimalistic though. So me and John, my supervisor, we chat about this a lot in the labs that we're not Instagrammable because you come in, you do two wing gates and we analyze the data. There's nothing sexy about it. It's just sweaty, yeah. horrible, super maximal work. Yeah. You can't Instagram it, but I'm pretty sure if we did like crazy dumbbell presses whilst on the bike, 
yeah, yeah, yeah. It'd be highly Instagrammable and we get a lot more likes. Yeah. So, but I think you find that those that are doing good jobs are, are less probably in the public eye versus those that are kind of just in it for the yeah. cash and just the, the fame. I'm not really fussed about the fame. <laughs> cash might be nice though. <laughs> Buy more kit. Because that's, that's what I mean. Like, we make money, it just goes back into the kit. Like, we bought ultrasound. We wanted wireless ultrasound because we wanted to see if we could look at fiber length. And we wanted to have a look at this whole idea that was floating around that you could measure glycogen content pre yeah. and post exercise, which I think is a bit sketchy. We actually look at how it's done. Um, but the ultrasound has been interesting for us to look at the, the changes in the muscle tissue pre and post supermax will work with the nerves, which is really interesting. Uh, yeah. And we're looking yeah. at stuff like that now as well. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, in our lab, we very seldom do a VO2 test. We don't do lactate testing anymore. Yeah. Uh, again, it's the same thing. You know that a boxer is probably going to have a resting uh, lactate probably between 2.1 and 3. Yeah. So it doesn't, you know, so you say this to students all the time when they look at the textbooks and look at 0.8 and 1 for resting. And they're like, no, no, no. Most of these athletes have been the two. Yeah. And they're like, but that doesn't make any sense. And I'm like, well, it does because most of them are constantly cutting weight. So they're constantly kind of metabolic in a flux. I said, so you're not going to get a true, 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 nice, pretty lab version of lactate. Yeah. So that's the only times we'll do it. And then post, post sparring or post wing gates, you'll see it in the, in the high 18s, 19s, 20s. So lactate for me is, in combat sports, is I think it's a relative waste of time for me. And it's expensive. Yeah. Those strips are really, really pricey. Yeah, you them. burn through them. The, the meter might be cheap. And and one thing I don't think people realize with lactate hand, portable hand meters, go look on the uh, validation of, of those hand, hand meters yeah. because I think if people realize, you know, the variation in some of the models that are commonly used, and I don't know why. I don't know why people think a certain lactate meter is better than the other. Like when I've looked at the the, the validation of those, some of them are, you might as well just be guessing. You'd have, you'd have better results yeah. just by physically yeah. watching the athlete and seeing deterioration and coordination or physically watching their, their breathing frequency and, and things like this. As for me, I'm like with the, especially some of them that are so popularly used. So I'm very adamant. I'm like, I'm Evan talked about this in one of the first episodes. It's like knowing the error margins of the tools that you're using. Yeah, and that's a biggie. Big, yeah, big, it's big. huge. So I've got I've got two lactate scout pros. Two exact same ones will give two different readings of the same athlete. Yeah, yeah. And not I mean not just like a marginal, but it could be like a one point one versus a three point one. Yeah. And you're like, but then I did this thing for, I did this research looking at. Uh, I talk to students a lot about this about even cortex. You can take two cortex metalizer three Bs. And there yeah. can be anywhere up to 7% difference in values yes. produced. Yes. Right? So when you look at the research on that, and you go, there's a 7% error margin, and then there can be anywhere up to 20% human error in how yeah. they're actually reading that or setting that up. So theoretically, you could have anywhere up to 27% of error on a yeah. bad day. Yeah. And so and this is something we say a lot to athletes when they go and see nutritionists at Adam Arlum, or they do VO2, they go for lab testing, or we say, how good is the quality of the lab test? Yeah. Because... I know myself, there's been days where we've run the cortex and you're looking at it and you're like, nah, that's, that's way out, way, way out. Um, and then you phone cortex out and they tell you just to use a predicted formula. And you're like, well, you know, like 47,000 pounds all the hardware, that's not yeah. a great answer. And, yeah. you know, so I, I'm very, um, and I, I've played around with all these. I had a Pinoy, which yeah. I, I, I get the base. I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm on the same page with you. <laughs> So yeah. and um, I, yeah, so and I've had other ones as well, and I've just never been that impressed. Yeah. Um, but what I am impressed by, and I, I mean, I'm very coming with a very tunnel vision biased approach. I have to make that quite clear. I am very knee deep into the nurse. You know, that is, yeah. I guess, my lens that I look at them through. Just purely because one of the more fascinating <laughs> things we have found is doing the incremental treadmill test with athletes, and we have a lot of data on this. Looking at rec fem, I'm a big rec fem lover. I'm not so keen on vasodilators. lateralis. Rec fem, gastroc. You see this beautiful picture on a good incremental test where you see this really nice desaturation. And then roughly where people will call VO2, you'll see that fast desaturation. But if yeah. you let those kids run a little bit longer, you go, no, 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 hold in, hold in. You get this double dip and you get this really beautiful second yeah. linear drop on it. And at first we were like, oh, it's just that athlete. Now we're like, athletes 
that are very good at this, that are that we are seeing some fantastic, hopefully this is going to be a paper we're going to come out hopefully this year, but we're going to look at using the Norse incremental treadmill test mm-hmm. because you do see this super beautiful, I'll see some data, it's a really beautiful double dip and it's really nice. And that's the point where VO2 probably is max, yeah. but in the lab, you probably would have called it maybe 30 seconds previous. So I don't even think we're getting proper VO2 readings because I think a lot of times, and I know myself from labs, as soon as the RER gets to 1.2 or whatever, they're like, we're just calling the test. You're volitionally done. They're not letting the kids get to pure volition where they're falling off the back of the treadmills. Yeah. Whereas we're a little bit more, let's fall off the back of the treadmill um, yeah. and just see how far we can actually take you. Because we have a lot of athletes come in that have been VO2 tested elsewhere and they're like, oh, I've got to 18 kilometers inclined to and bailed out. And I'm like, huh. And I'm like, did you want to bail out? And they're like, oh, I might, could have went another step. And I'm like, well, yeah. you fucking will be going for another step in this lab. So yeah. just get at it. And we've discovered there's an interesting breakpoint further on. But I think the moxie on an incremental gives you everything you need. You can get a rough idea of fat match. You can get a rough idea of steady state. You can get a rough idea of all of these things once you get comfortable with it. Yeah. And I think NARS is an amazing proxy tool. I don't think you need a cortex anymore unless you want the VO2 score. But eventually, I think we'll be able to look at that and correlate that anyway. I don't think that's it's going to be a problem. I'm, I'm completely on board with you. And I know people are so like, oh, nears, you can't. I'm like, and it's too, um, I think one thing I agree with you. First of all, nears is the most reliable device in sports technology that I've ever used. Yeah. If you want to talk about lactate, the amount of skill it takes to get the same uh, droplet every time, yeah. like yeah. you have sweat contaminating it, you have plasma contaminating it, right? Like the, how you yeah. squeeze to get it every time how long you wait, like you wait 30 seconds because you had to redo it or you wait 10 seconds because the athlete didn't give your hand the right way. Yeah. There And the humidity in the air, there's a million things. Then you go into VO2. It's like, how long of a warm up did they have? What did they eat? You know, all these different things make it, you know, they can make a significant difference. But the other thing too is like, you know, how, how are you calibrating that machine? How well is the calibration done? There is a million and one things. What are the calculations being used? Um, and then, you know, with Moxie is, you know, what you're talking about, the incremental test. I've seen it on every single test. What you're looking for generally, whether it's a, you know, lactate turn points or, you know, VT1, VT2, and whether you're looking for a profile, like through critical power of how big the W prime is, all these things I've seen in Moxie. And I've seen them clear and they're representable yeah. and they're repeatable. And yes, there is higher, my thing is there is higher sensitivity with nears and sometimes that threshold can change. But I think that is because the threshold is changing day to day and nears is picking up something locally that VO2 cannot pick up systemically. And the same with lactate cannot pick up systemically. So I think people that give the argument for, you know, oh, VO2, try and true, it's right on point. It's like, I think the local threshold is a different thing every day compared to a systemic threshold. Yeah, and I, we're upset. We're, we're more interested in this local threshold. This is the one for us that I think we think is the buffer issue. We think this is where, if you think it can, uh, you know, and you know, you think it can uh, vault blood coming to the muscle, the capillary bed, the density, the capillary bed, the O2 gradient exchange. Yeah. The, the ability to extract and utilize and, the, and how the myoglobin relates. That I, I think this is the key of where we need to get to. This is the stuff that yeah. we're looking at. We're looking at, you know, is there high volume blood flow, high increase of vasodilation, does that create a surplus that can't be extracted? Is there delays? What's the O2 grade exchange like? All yeah. this type of interesting stuff. I think that's where it's at because I've always believed that most of the kids that come out of our lab, if you throw them in a treadmill test, they'll do relatively well. Yeah. But make them do a very intense pad session that they're not used to doing, it falls apart pretty fast. Put them in a highly competitive spar, it falls apart really fast. Yeah. So everyone previously is like, oh, VO2, good VO2, they'll do really well. You know, Gosh said it in the papers, Phil Davis all said it in the papers, you know, if an athlete's got a VO2 of like 52 or 47, you know, blah, they'll, they'll do okay. Um, we don't need to have massive aerobic capacity for the sport. Yeah. So we shouldn't be training it, you know, like yeah. you're a, you know, you're running like a tour marathon or whatever. You, we need to be training slightly different. It's the localized site that's more interesting because especially in striking arts, especially kicking arts and these arts, that's what we need to train, the ability to utilize the oxygen in the tissue and kind of, you know, that supply and demand, fine balance is what really needs to be finely dialed in. Yeah. And you can't get that 
unless you're looking at some form of nurse derivative. Yeah. I mean, we've looked at everything, we looked at thermography, we did all that type of stuff, we looked at everything. We're, we're at a point now where we're, we've done thousands and thousands of placements of sensors that I'm pretty good at getting on the same spot, you know, yeah. and then obviously for the lab, you obviously you're marking them up with a surgical marker anyway, so you're getting exactly yeah. the same point. And I'm not seeing wild shifts in the same athlete. So if yeah. they come in and the baseline, which we always always explain to students, is just an abstract value, it's just a starting point. If they come in with an 80% level starting point, it may fluctuate, you know, 68, 92, but it's 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 it balances and normalizes out once we normalize the data. Yeah. So we're not seeing massive shifts, except, and we're doing this just now when we're looking at mitochondrial capacity and we're looking at, and we're using basically kind of obviously the McCulley idea of rapid occlusions, exercise test, more rapid uh, occlusions, yeah. Yeah. implement an intervention for three weeks, reassessing it. We are seeing that sprint training, especially super maximal, we are seeing changes in the mitochondrial capacity of the tissue. It's quite yeah. clear. Yeah. And that's where nurse gets really exciting for us because we think we're in a position where we can prototype non-invasive testing in the field for, that, yeah. for athletes and coaches. Because at the end of the day, it, for me, it comes back to mitochondria all the time. You know, in our lab, students are probably sick of hearing it. You know, yeah. it's mitochondria, mitochondria, mitochondria. <laughs> you have to be able to produce yes. energy to use energy. You can't. <clears throat> It comes back to underlying physiology and oxidative phosphorylation and all that good stuff. Yeah. But you need to know why and how is that responsive in the muscle tissue. Otherwise, what are you doing? You know, just bicep curling, just squatting. These are fine. Yeah. But are you actually getting a performance benefit from it? That's yeah. that's the big thing for me. But the more we dial into mitochondria and we dial into getting these, these markers right, that's when we start to see athletes last longer in the fights. And that's where it gets really, really super exciting. Um, but not everyone believes in it. So it's, you, know, you always have two sides. People are, I mean, we're quite yeah. lucky that we have quite a lot of interest. Team GB are quite interested. We were down at Team GB, met with their physiology team, and we basically did a presentation on it. The GB Taekwondo squad were there. So we re them in that. So we had a good chance to chat to them about Moxie. Whether they'll use it or look at it, we don't really know. It's early days, but we'd like to think they might have a, a little look at it because we think if you want a cheap proxy measure or something, Physiologically, a heart rate monitor and a and nerves, you can get bucket loads of really interesting data. So good. If you can analyze it. So yeah. we are we are kind of fortunate that I, that I spent quite a long period of my life in computing. So we've got some really nice scripts, takes the data, processes it, parses it. We run all the linear regressions. We can we can do a lot of things. We can do causational kind of regressions. And we're doing this thing now where I'm looking at um because some interesting things like the, you know, when you reach peak heart rate. You get kind of your kind of your maximum point of desaturation. It's an interesting correlation. So in sparring rounds, I'll take that data, we punch data, and we'll convert it into like a 3D position, almost like um, almost like in visual effects, and then do kind of deep mapping. And then we can kind of actually look at the whole spar as a 3D process, and we can take individual time points related to the footage, and we can look at what occurred at that particular second in time. You know, what was the heart rate? What was the oxygen yeah. level? What punch was thrown? What type of punch was thrown? And what occurred? six or seven seconds after it. So we're, we're working towards this bigger 3D kind of dimensional model of physiology and how we can look at it from a performance analysis point of view. Because I think for me, that's that's the interesting thing that you see, you know, like a single leg takedown go wrong and then really bad recovery after it. And you're kind of like, yeah. well, is that just a byproduct? That was an explosive movement. Yeah. And then as I do the analysis, I start to see it occurs time and time again. And then when we do modeling on it and we do moxie on it, we just get this really beautiful interactive 3D model that we can spin around and go this second, that second. How do we take this? Yeah. So we're we're probably doing analyzing Moxie data slightly differently to other people. We're a bit more out of the box. We're a bit more like we have a sport that has time and we have physiological data. We have movement also. And if we track yeah. that movement and we track it with the physiological data, can we marry up and look at it in 3D space? Yeah. Which we can. And then again, some real interesting things about distal correlations between this point in time, that point in time, what the rate of change was, the volume of work that's thrown, the punches that were thrown, and how all of that maps to physiological metric. And that's it's basically my PhD. That's kind of what we're looking at. It's just kind of slightly different, I think, to what other people are are doing. Because yeah. I'm I'm only interested in, I guess, for me, as much as I love the lab. It's for me is about how do you actually apply it at the end of the day? Because we could do loads of papers looking at 
the fatigue rate or the rate of decay in 20 punches on the fourth, fourth platform. And I yeah. could get them published a relatively three-star ref framework yeah. and tick all the boxes for the uni as much as I bloody want. Yeah. But it's not going to change how somebody fights. It's not going to change how somebody recovers. So it's really of no interest to me. And I'm, I'm lucky. Like, I'm not a 27-year-old PhD student. I'm a 49-year-old miserable, moaning, grumpy PhD student. So yeah. I'm only interested in things that really appeal to me. I have that luxury that Everything I do is performance and combat. So let's do it. One of the things we do want to look at is we want to do 3D motion capture with NARS, EMG, and ground reaction force and look at you know, what is the implication of ground reaction force on biomechanics striking and how does that then for relate to oxygen desaturation, resaturation values, and recovery. So we can get a better picture. So yeah, so we're super geeky. Put old blokes in the lab working on. I, I think that that is a it's funny because like when i see what you're doing with fighting it's kind of like there's such a se separation from what's currently going on in the research like i yeah. feel like people wouldn't even be able to like if they were to read what's currently out there there's no way that they would think what you're doing was it is in the technological capability and method methodological capability sorry um uh capability of you know where research is at it's like you're studying what the questions that should kind of be being asked and answered versus what you know they're still stuck on like they think like that i don't know maybe it's this thing where they think oh we have to understand everything about weight cutting before we ask a question we have to have, understand everything about incremental exercise tests and VO2 mass tests with uh, VO2 max tests with fighters before we ask. It's like, I don't really think that's, you know, applicable. And I think it's a lot of it. It's, it's just dogma carried over from endurance hmm. sports and other things. Yeah. Um, and it's like, but what you're talking about is because fighting, like, just like you've said so many times in this podcast, your VO2 max is really kind of irrelevant for the most part like i've seen a fighter come in with a 66 vo2 max guy barely runs he smashed most of the runners on even on the actual speed on the treadmill test itself it's like and you know what i mean he, he's not known for his gas tank he's not known <laughs> at all for his gas tank yeah. to put it that way yeah. right like he's got decent cardio but nowhere's near and and it's it's basically you know I think people are chasing a lot of the wrong things and fighting. Sometimes it's, it's how can you manage your physiology in the ring? And I think that's yeah. the big difference of what you're measuring. And yeah. I've tried to listen to like, you know, what the, you know, UFC performance Institute and some of the stuff that they're doing. I don't know how much of that they're doing. I'm not, not sure. Any of it. It's, it's yeah. a funny thing. Cause I, that that's probably the biggest comparison we get. <clears throat> people ask me, I don't have anything to do with Duncan French or, or what they do. I, I've read the handbook yeah, and it looks, just looks like the same old stuff to me. It doesn't yeah. look like what I love. You know, I, I think, so I'm in a very lucky position because after my master's degree, uh, I had lots of options. And then obviously I spent three years of using Moxie before I even took up a PhD. Yeah. And I just was very lucky that when I was looking for universities that John Barbary was kind of batshit crazy enough as a supervisor to go, I love combat sports and I work with world champion kickboxes. So this is a marriage made in heaven and it turns out the uni's only 25 minute drive away from my house which is an even bigger benefit and john is kind of as crazy as i am so yeah. so you know like we've converted the labs we've got force plates in the walls and all that stuff for striking so so john's given me the freedom to say well what is it you really want to know about the sport and let's build the phd run about what you want to, to find out rather than a conventional oh we'll do a wing gate test we'll do this test which are easy to do, right? The other thing is, is I'm doing my PhD in two years. So, I mean, I'm smashing through mine. And that, again, is just because I have access to some good athletes. But so I have a, a different drive to most people because once my PhD is done, we then move into the more exciting realm of postdoc work. We get into some really good stuff because this is just foundation level stuff for me at the moment. It's just building the roadmap of what do we have? What can we see? Then we can start layering everything on top and really get into like why, like, so basically, after this, we'll probably get into wireless uh, and kind of tracker-free 3D motion capture analysis and, and start to correlate this to, is the glenohumeral joint coming through the right plane of motion? How does that relate to the leg heaviness? Is the body pivoted over the front leg? 
in which case is that why desaturation is occurring? If a more yeah. neutral position was present, would the hip come through more? These are the things that wake me up at three in the morning and I go, shit. <laughs> you know, like, so I talk about this quite a lot. Yeah. When I watch, I mean, I tend sparring a lot. And the other big difference we've seen, I speak to my wife about this a lot and I go, I've left my PhD really late in life. And she'll always say the same thing. She'll go, one, at 27, you would never have had world champion athletes under your belt. So yeah. that's a non-starter. Two, yeah. nurse was never there. Yeah. She says, so you could never have done this PhD at 27. She goes, you could only do this PhD now because everything is just aligned at the right point. So that's it. But the other thing is, is I have over 20 years of coaching. So holding pads, tie pads, sparring. So when I watch sparring now, it's just like scalar vectors to me. It's just, it's, I'm probably highly on the autistic spectrum probably. But when I watch it, it's just like, it's just like numbers. Like when I'm sparring, it's like hip position, internal rotation of hip. Femur's not in the right place. Scapula's not in the right place. Leg is heavy here. Body's pivoted over the front. Should have been neutral. And I just like, I'm like one of these crazy kids in the corner, like yeah. scoring away. That's how I see sparring now. I can't watch boxing anymore and just watch yeah. boxing. It's, it just becomes a case of that position wasn't there. Inside line of attack was compromised. Should have been outside position. Hip would have extended. Arm would have come through. Heads off the line. Wonder what Moxie would have told me. And yeah. I just think, you know, and I'm in a very lucky position. Um, but there is no way me and John, we need other researchers doing similar things to build the bigger picture. But yeah. The problem is, from a university point of view, combat sports is generally in a side project. It's not a main project because it's very difficult to get a high scoring research paper with combat sports. Yeah. And in the UK, there's the Research and Excellence Framework. And most universities want to get three stars or four star papers. Most want four stars. It's very difficult to get a four star combat paper. So the university's focus generally tends to be in endurance based cycling that type of thing, that they can get a higher score in paper out of it. Abertay, on the other hand, because we're a small university, are very much a case of, no, let's just go super niche, and we'll do other, and our asides will be endurance and everything else, but our main focus will be purely combat sports and golf. Yeah, <laughs> Which yeah. is like, and golf's an interesting one, because you think there's it no is. correlation between combat sports and, and golf, but there's actually a really interesting Huge. correlation, yeah, between hip motion the ability to have disassociation from upper limb and lower limb. Yeah. And there's a lot of really super interest. And Ashley, who does, uh, who's a biomechanist, is pretty switched on. So he has phenomenal understanding of 3D motion capture. So it's just a perfect marriage that he can do all that when the combat sports environment as well was. So we can take all that stuff and apply it. Uh, and that's it. So I think it's incredibly exciting times for combat sports, but yeah. we need more researchers thinking outside the box rather than I'm going to do a weight cutting paper. Or the big thing at the moment is looking at the power of the rear hand. That's quite, quite, quite common. I see a lot of papers on that. And the other one is looking at how do the grounds contribute to power generation, which, you know, which actually from an S&C point of view, you've seen a lot more papers, but I think there's only two papers when it actually looks at the biomechanics and the kinematics of striking. Seth's got a paper out there from Australia. I think he's in, is he in Australia? I can't remember. Um, but he's got an interesting paper which shows the kinematic sequence is really ankle, you know, rec fem, and then it goes up that way, which is kind of interesting to me as well. Because for a lot of years I've been saying we need to spend less time doing uh, deltoid work and more time probably doing quadricep work. Especially uh, probably, on your, I'm on your thing. Probably and single leg as well. Single leg. I'm a big single leg lover. Let's do single leg workouts and... Um, what we have discovered is lately with a couple of athletes is going back to old school, really heavy bags and working mm. good biomechanics. Now we're getting a lot of medial kind of deltoid development. We're getting all that anyway. So yeah. we don't need to be doing any more of it. We've got enough of it and it's more sports specific on the, the way the fibers are recruiting. So yeah. I think there's a lot of work in that as well. So yeah. I'm just rambling again, sorry. <laughs> no, no, I, I'm loving it because you're really, there's a there's something with MMA. Like I have a lot of the, I have this kind of love-hate relationship, but I've stopped really providing information, even to people that ask me. Like I, I don't go around the gyms that much anymore. But a lot of that reason is just because it just bounces off. There's no 
like where MMA is at, it's like people aren't looking at it like a sport. They're kind of looking at it like this kind of ethereal, like, oh, it's just combat. It's like, yeah. but even if you look at what, you know, combat athletes are doing, like in the military, for example, those people are shooting people in the face and they're still taking a scientific approach to, you know, response, coordination, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, biomechanics. Like I've been to these courses. I know what's going on in those. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. But with fighting, it's just kind of like, oh, no, it's, you know, the same old strength and conditioning and same old, like, what, what I tell people is, first of all, we need to move the physiology because if you don't have the underlying physique, what do you think, why do you think Nate Diaz is, is, is a good MMA fighter? Do you think he's strong? You know what I mean? Do you think he's yeah. fast? Do you think, what, what is it about him, right? He throws yeah. two punches. He throws yeah. two punches. How can he outbox someone throwing a jab and a right hand, right? And he's slower than anything. He's got zero strength. Why is he a good fighter? Well, one reason, he's got a very good in endurance base, right? Yeah. But Thank the other you. thing is economy of movement. Like, there's all these little factors. I'm not saying Nate Diaz is a good example of what people should be aiming for, but I don't think people are asking the right question. How could someone, if you take Nate Diaz and you watch him train, like, just by himself, you would be like, there's no way that guy looks like a good athlete. Yeah. And yeah, I gave it, in yeah. terms of athletes, like, yeah, he's not that good of an athlete, but what makes him good? Because if he can be good, there's something going on there that people are missing, right? There's something going on there that people are missing. One thing is, yeah, obviously we said it's endurance bait, but economy of movement. If you watch his punches, like regardless of whether he's using a, 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 a good kinetic chain when he's, when he's punching, there is an economy of movement. There's no, there's not a lot of wasted movement. Yeah. And the other thing is, you know, what's going on with the timing there? Like people just, I, and I feel like anytime, you know, people, I, when I used to teach class, for example, pe there was, there's people that loved my class and there was people that absolutely hated it. And a lot of it <laughs> were the guys that were fighters and they're yeah. expecting to go in and sweat. And I'm saying, I'm telling them that we're learning how to fight we're not, we're not doing strength and conditioning right now. Yeah. You're ha you have yeah. your time to do pads. You have your time to do bed, bag work. This is a class. We're trying to learn how to fight. And if I'm going to sit here and tell you to, you know, go blow your wad out, you know, in between these drilling sessions and get a big, huge sweat on and, you know, ventilation rate going through the roof, like that's missing the point because what makes Nate Diaz a good fighter or, or, you know, all these other people, a good fighter, like whoever it is you want to pick. It's all what's going on in, you know, their base physiology, which you're not going to get in a class, right? Exactly. You're not going to get in a class. And yeah. it's the actual psychological tactics, tactics. It's the strategy. It's the technique. Those are the things that are going to make you a good fighter. And if you want to go and blow your wad, that's kind of counterintuitive to, to getting where you want to go. And I think that what you're doing and you said, you know, there's a question, how can it, you know, does it make us better? And yes, inherently it does. You just have to do it right. Like you're saying, like, yeah. And that's, it, I mean, it. yeah, I mean, I'm a, I mean, I see this all the time. Boxers need to be able to box. So yes. we should be putting, so my big thing is, is, is I'm a big believer in, in the type of work that we're doing because we see the results, but everything is centered around boxing the sport. So I want the boxers to technically be proficient. So I'm a big lover on technical work, technical sparring, biomechanics. They're a big, 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 massive lover in it. My issue is, is I think strength work is starting to overtake other components yes. of training, right? Yeah. But if you look at Nate Diaz and you look at Diaz brother generally, and you look at other athletes, look at GSP, whatever, a lot of their general physical preparation are things they like to do, triathlons, gymnastics, yeah. all these yeah. sort of things. I'm a big lover of that. We should get your general physical preparation out of things you love to do. Because when you love to do something, you will push a little bit harder. Yeah. And if you, because everything we do in the labs, even with Hannah, where our sprint sessions and the walk bike are super maximal. So we, we have seen enough. And my supervisor's PhD has been in high intensity the last 15 years. So John's a bit of an expert on this. But our big thing is, is most people don't train hard enough. Yes. So if we can give you three 20 second sprints with 10 second break, and you can do it fucking super maximal, and we mean yeah. super maximal, we will see the mitochondrial capacity change yeah. three times a week. Three times a week, three weeks, we get nine sessions. That's enough to start seeing some structural physiological change. Most people don't want to do it. 
most people won't do 20 seconds, balls to the wall, all out on the bike because it's too hard. But they'll go and do a 20 mile run with no real effort. Yeah. Fucking backpack and two liters of water. And you're like, well, well, why would we do this when that six hour run could have been two hours technical training? It could have been, you know, some mobility or whatever the fuck you want to call it. And it could be some rehab training. Why would you go and put your body under that amount of duress when it's not that related? Except if you have a Diaz or you're one of these kids that that's what they love to do and they're yeah. economic because the thing about good triathlon athletes and good runners is they have good economy because yeah. they know to get the best times they have to be relaxed they have yeah. to have good stride everyone has to land the right way the problem with most boxers are they don't know how to fucking run properly yeah. so they're Just running all the themselves. time yeah that's the issue I'm saying this people I'm not against running because I like running myself but you need to know how to run <laughs> Yeah. You know, it's like, so it's interesting because we're down at Team GB and one of the performance tests they do is very similar to us. They do like a fast 1K time trial. Yeah. And they do a fast 3K. And all my athletes, I basically, the only run I make them do is a fast 5K run on a Monday because it's the only thing I know they'll do because in their mindset, they now understand that if they can smash in under 20 minutes, it's done (laughs) and they don't have to run for the rest of the week. But it's a great proxy of recovery for me. So if, a kid that normally runs 17, 12, suddenly starting to hit 21 back to back. I know that something's occurred in the training regime because I know if he's got a 17, 17, 17, 12 regular split time all the time, that something's changed. And for athletes that I don't see in person, it's a great proxy. But 5K to me is a sprint. It's a good sprint. It's like, yeah, sure, sprint five kilometers. Or do a nice three minute 12, 1K run or under 60 minute for 3K. And that's as much running as I need them to do. I don't need them to do anything else. Um, if they want to go do BMX riding or whatever, I'm up for it. If they want to go hiking in the mountains, don't have a problem with it. But a lot of times I'm just like, just do something you really, really want to do. Because one of the best athletes we ever had was a really shit golfer, but he loved golf and played golf nonstop. And he had some of the best body shots of any athlete we ever worked with. Just because... Yeah. He just spent, he was like meticulous in the range. So he's in the range all the time, just swinging, 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 swinging. I mean, he was shit at it, but you know, he loved doing it. So it, for him, that was it. And we, people used to say to me, you can't have an athlete play golf three times a week. And I was like, why not? I was like, because he's winning everything and the kickboxing tournaments. I went, so obviously something's right. You come to the lab, smash all these tests. Yeah. But his coach was like, no, he needs to be here grinding out run. He needs to go at five in the morning and do a 12 mile up. Yeah. And I was like, why don't you just go let them play around the golf at five in the morning? Yeah. So it is, it's just mindset. I think you're right. I think the problem we have is coaches don't want to invest in the time and learn biochemistry. They don't want to learn about glycolysis or kind of metabolism because they think it's irrelevant. They don't yeah. really want to learn about oxidative phosphorylation and mitochondria and you know cellular matrices and all that stuff because it's a waste of time. But yet it's all that stuff that kind of drives the engine. That's the pistons and everything else. Yeah. I keep saying to young SNC coaches, if you learn that, you'll be able to identify it and you'll be able to change things to make it much more efficient. But I think it, I, I don't know whether it's maybe just not, it's not as attractive as an Olympic lift, maybe sitting waiting yeah. through a textbook of metabolism. <laughs> yeah, because it <laughs> takes it 20 years to learn, right? And it's super <laughs> fancy and all oh, that's going to have huge payoff for you. Um, but the one thing that you did note there is you're, known, you're talking about golfers. And this is one thing I've noticed is, I think athletes and MMA, it's very unique because MMA is kind of this black sheep when it comes to sport where there's a lot of people that come into it without a really good athletic background, Mm. or if they do come into it, it's from like a wrestling background or whatever, maybe it's a boxing and they don't inherently, this is one thing I've noticed. People that come in as a good general athlete, whether you were just talking about golfing, right? Let's just talk about another sport that's very technical, baseball. Baseball, If you can throw an 85 mile an hour fastball, 85 mile an hour or 90 mile an hour fastball, you are inherently going to figure out how to punch harder, a lot different than someone that's coming to it from a wrestling background. And that's the thing. It's like the same thing with golf. I play, I used to play like a hundred rounds a year as a kid. What I learned from the bomb mechanics of golf literally set up a a, basically a a reduct reduction and learning volume and learning load and pretty much every other sport I did because with golf you literally have to swing this tiny little club head into this tiny little ball 
you know, a hundred times, or, you know, if you're, if you're going to the range beforehand, 80 times or whatever during a, a, a round, right. Depending yep. on how good you are. And if you could connect that tiny little club head to that co- tiny little ball and make it go far, make it go accurate. Biomechanically, there's a lot going on there that you have to physically control and inherently, you know, manage. So the thing is, I've always seen is people that have had a wide base in sport and generally some of these more unique sports, whether it's responding to an athlete in front of you, like a hockey player or a soccer player, or a football player, that's a skill that you're just not going to get when you're wrestling. Like, yes, wrestling, you're dealing with another athlete, but you're not trying to evade and you're not trying to read moving distances from very, very fast yeah. speeds like that. It's just kind of acute. It's very acute with wrestling. And there's all these different skills that come into play. And what you're talking about, it's like, hey, go learn that because the inherent qualities that they're going to pick up through the things that they like, there is going to be some transfer there, most likely, whether it's relaxing and, and whatever yeah. it is. But yes, I'm especially, with you. especially with young athletes. So we, we quite uh, we encourage young athletes to take up quite a few different sports. Yeah. Because they're conscious that this sport might not pan out for them, so there may be others. Yeah. But going back to the golf, interesting thing about the golf was, because I went on the TPI course because I was fascinated with the kinematics of the golf swing because my golf yeah. was really bad and it really frustrated me that I could never do the same thing twice. Yeah. So I did that course. And what I realised with high-end golf players is the swing may be clumsy with some of them, but the ability to change the club head last minute to hit the ball was always spot on. Yeah. And that takes real fine motor function to be able to do that at that speed. And that really, really fascinated me on the, the whole idea that they, they have that physicality, that physical ability and kind of, I guess, kind of motor neuron response that at the last minute they can just change the club heads. Even if they're yeah. off, they can recognize biomechanically they're yes. off, right? Yeah. So I started getting into this as well with like the hand on these people is, you know, this whole idea when they're on the pads that not to throw the hand until they felt that they're in the right position to throw the hand. Yeah. Because I think a lot of times, in this, and especially in martial arts, mixed martial arts, we just throw things because we throw things. Yeah. You know, the amount of times you come off the pad, you skim it the wrong way, and you're like, and I think, well, why did you throw it? It's because the coach encouraged you to go one, two, one, two, slip, slip. Yeah. Whereas, yeah, yeah. whereas I change it up now, now, I'm like, I'd rather you throw. And this is what we've seen through the nurse research as well, is that, it's better to drill quality movement repeatedly and for the athlete to biomechanically and probably proprioceptively understand the feeling of the right movement and when everything's engaged so that when they spar, when they feel the same opportunity, boom, just lands. Yeah. So we've been doing a lot of this. With, and nurse, it was nurse that let us see that a lot of times when something is repeated uh, repeatedly thrown the right way and lands at the same time, the efficiency value is, is much better. The economy of motion is much better. Yeah. But how do you turn that into sparring? And then through all the data, we looked at them and went, well, in sparring, they're only throwing 50 punches around. So why are we why are we throwing three to 350 punches on the heavy bag around, whereas probably 90% of them are shit quality? Would it not be better just throwing 50 really good, explosive, proper, kinematically sequenced yeah. punches yeah. on the bag and yeah. then see how that goes into sparring. And yeah. that is where we're having phenomenal results. Yeah. Um, because now we're like, now these kids are landing, everyone's packed, shoulders packed, hips in the right position, good extension. And that was what happened in Hannah's last fight, unfortunately for Alejandra, that in the seventh and eighth round, Hannah just connected with everything mechanically the right way. And yeah. the girl just, the girl was just, that was it. It's too much for her. So I think there's a place for all of it. But I think... I'm one of these people as well. Is what is sport specificity? What is sport specific training? What is what is that? Because yeah. it's different things to different people. You know, it's like landline press is sport specific. And I'm like, well, nobody punches a bar and nobody's throwing yeah. a bar, yeah. right? So, and then yeah. there's time on and time off target, which isn't there on the bar. So now yeah. coaches are throwing it back to replicate that. But we know that the forearm muscle is the last muscle to engage in the strike, and it's debatable whether it really makes a massive amount of distance difference in power. So. Is that really a sport-specific way of training it? I don't really know. Um, I'm not convinced that it is. So I think I think about the 70s and the 80s when I was a kid, we had some phenomenal athletes in horrific shape, but they all BMXed, they all rollerbladed, they all did crazy base jumping, just did anything that could kill you, you did it, and we all seemed to be quite good fighters. Then we have this next slew that has went very heavy on S&C, 
but seems to have lost the essence of what they're trying to do. And it's lost yes. the essence of the sport. And like, how do you marry that up? How do you, how do you put that back? And then my challenge is, is how do I then add another layer, which is all this batshit crazy sports science and make it something that the athletes can go, yeah, yeah, we'll do that. That, that, sounds, that sounds really, really good. And that's the difficulty for us. However, going back to nerves, the beautiful thing about nerves is once an athlete's used to wearing that, they don't give a shit about it being slapped on them. They do not care. None of our kids ever go, I don't want that one today. Because you know yourself, it's so light. Yeah. So we can start, I mean, I can put six mocks on a kid's spar and then they'll never, ever bat an eyelid. It doesn't change performance. They don't even know it's on them because they've had it on them so many times. But we get such such amazing data from it, which is, it just strikes me as a great tool for that. I don't understand why people, are, uh, a lot of you know, universities I've spoken to have discounted it. Yeah. It's, it's not very valuable. Well, I think one of the reasons <clears throat> why is there's a, well, maybe it's, it's, a, it's just because it's not giving you a number, mm. right? It, it's yeah. it, you know what i mean a specific <laughs> yeah, number yeah. and it's gonna that number is going to change from person to person people are like not useful it's not useful it's like uh it's just it's hard to wrap my head around like literally this is giving you live feedback right now of what's going on right there at this point of time at this specific muscle that's you know and i'm with you on the rec fem thing it's like i don't know what this you know i'm not a huge fan of last it's like the the vastus lateralis for me like especially just crossing the one joint it's like it doesn't make a lot of sense for most things that go on in sport, whether that's yeah. cycling, running, whether yeah. it, or whatever it is, it's like, I'm a huge fan of the rec fan. And I, you, anyways, but the whole thing that you're talking about too, is like with this, you know, going out and doing a lot of sports, the SNC is like, if people are looking to, you know, and this is what SNC tries to sell is like, Oh, I'm going to teach you how to move. I'm going to teach you how to do all these yeah. things properly. It's like, if I see anything in SNC, it's like people come out of there moving like robots more than anything. And yeah. it's because of the strategies that are needed to lift weight. And they're saying you have to make this position to be able to lift the maximal amount of weight. Now, there's a big difference between lifting the maximal amount of weight to being coordinated and providing an impulse, like with yes. force and how yeah, fast exactly. that impulse transfers. Because yes. I can go out and pick you, you know, 20 guys that can probably total 1500 to 2000 pounds and we'll see how well they they can apply that to anything and it's like that's literally what you're doing and they think you know i'm I'm not saying that there's no use to to squatting and there's no use to some of these things and med ball throws and these things i think there's a ton of uses there i think it, there just needs to be a reframing around when is this appropriate what are we trying to achieve here um and that's one thing i wanted to ask you on is like I see this thing with, uh, you know, repeated sprint intervals. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan of what you're doing with that because I think one, I don't know if you see this as well, is it, it would build a lot of the psychological capacities when we're talking about managing effort, managing RPE, managing yeah. maximal effort, recovering, yeah. and also just having the, the self-efficacy to dig in and know that this is how long it's going to take me to come back out of it. And then I can dig in again and I'm going to be safe here. I'm, it's not a threat to the system. What, what do you see with that? Like, what do you see the benefits? No, that, of that? That, that, you just hit the nail on the head. So it's a pity Hannah wasn't in the podcast today because <clears throat> she will, she will tell you that she absolutely hates the sprint sessions. Like she will send me messages. You could not play in public because the language would be so blue in them. <laughs> she really fucking hates them. Yeah. But what she said to me was that, and it's her that coined this whole being comfortable and the uncomfortable. Because she had said to me that, a bit like me, we, me and her spoke about it quite a lot. I used to find sparring the most still moment in my life. Like I could have a lot of chaos in my life, but sparring was the most calmest thing. And so I would do hours of sparring in my gym because I just felt really still. And for her, it's a little bit like the, the sprint tests. So these sprints, or putting her into positions of discomfort that she doesn't really like. And she knows also that she can never get better at them because the benchmark just keeps coming up. So you can never pass it. It's like, as good as you get, is not as yeah. good as you're going to be tomorrow, right? So there's, there's yeah. like, there's this psychological thing that she knows every time she go hit 712 watts, I'm like, no, no, you need to hit 800. And yeah. she's, when she, gets, she knows she gets 800, I'm going to throw up and go, no, it's not fucking good enough. We yeah. need to have 842. But psychologically, it's been really good for her. Because she knows that 
the things that she'll probably tell you if she was here is that she now knows that she can push really, really hard and she can go to a dark place and she knows she's going to be fine. Yeah. And that psychologically for her means that she knows it doesn't matter how gritty the round gets or how bloody the round gets, it's not as hard as doing a 20 second or 30 second wing kick. Yeah. Which is crazy when you think about it, right? Yeah. You think of the contact sport. Example, in the fight with Alexandra, the heads clash, the massive hematoma. We were like, ooh, this is not good. And she just was like, yeah, it's all right. Kind of had worse. And all of that's just that whole grind of the sprints. So I think it fosters, obviously you're getting the nice physiological adaptations, but psychologically it fosters a temperament that you can't get a lot of other ways. Because when you come to our labs, we will scream at you when you're doing those wing gates to get the best out of you. And they will be the two worst 30 seconds of your life. And if you're very unlucky or you're very lucky, depending on how you look at it, you might be wise three times a week for those sprints. And But after a time, a lot of these athletes, psychologically, just seem much stronger. You see it in the pad work, you see it in spar, and it's just, they can go deeper and harder because they know they've been there. So, yeah. so how do you, so I think about this quite a lot, and I think, well, if we want, and this is why I said, uh, when we could chat beforehand, that when I say to coaches that the closest thing to sparring is maybe a wing gate, they don't understand what I mean. And it's physiologically, it's probably close from the demand, that rapid demand, but psychologically. Because when you've done a full-on sprint and you've got 20-second recovery and we're yeah. asking you to beat that sprint beforehand and you've given it everything, you maybe peaked at 1,200 watts and you're like, no, no, we need 1,230. It's a yeah. dark place to have to go repeat it. So an example with Hannah, she will come to lab, do an incremental treadmill test, follow up by two 30 second wing gate sprints, do the upper crank 30 second wing gate sprints and repeat it. That's what she can now do. When she came to me the first time, she was in the fetal position and she came off the bike. She was like, I'm not doing that. That's that really fucking, that's, now it's the opposite. Now she can do them back to back and maintain only roughly maybe 60, 70% watt drop and the second rotation. So we're getting to a position now where she can maintain it. Which I would argue, Hannah, if you're listening to this further down the line, you're maybe not working hard enough. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that drop off should be more. Um, so I think you're right. I think it's a great tool psychologically. Yeah. I love all that stuff. I, I know I like it myself. It's just it is, as we would say, gnarly though. But that's the sport. So I yeah. would argue that that's maybe more sport specific than landmine pressing or hitting a high a hammer off a tire. <laughs> what do you think? I like, I mean, what's your thoughts? I mean, yeah. On it, what do you think? No, I'm, I'm a huge fan of that. And I used to, I tried to bounce this, bounce this off people so many times and being like, to the way I look at it is, you know, kind of from this rheostatic mechanism where, or homeostatic, allostatic mechanism, right? Psychologic, this, the psychology of fighting has, like we were talking earlier, has this, a huge play on the physiology. Yeah. And I think that if you can manage that, that psychology, you are going to therefore inherently in, in decrease your allostatic load. And yes. if you can decrease that allostatic load, your ability to uh, fulfill your potential, your physiological potential in the fight is going to be much better. Now, you know, I didn't start at it from that way. I, I was talking to Robbie Bork the other day. And one of the things I used to do is go in the pool with athletes and manage CO2 tolerance. Because right. if you can psychologically manage your CO2 tolerance by doing these underwater dives with the yeah. bricks, pushing yeah, the yeah, bricks, yeah. <clears throat> I found, <clears throat> sorry, I found a huge payoff just in being able to manage the psychological stress and shark tanking, whatever it was with the athletes and training. The other big thing was cold water. It was like, these are things all outside of physiology, but if you can wake up in the morning, walk straight out of your bed from those warm sheets, step into ice cold water that's been freezing outside that you have to break the ice open in, your ability to override your system and your ability for your system to inherently understand like the threat response appropriately is going to be yeah. much better. And that's the thing. This is why I'm a huge believer in sprints is because psychologically what the athlete takes away from it is huge. But not only psychologically, if we're talking about physio ph physiologically, it is probably one of the biggest drivers for overall performance with fighting, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I think so on both sides, I think it's huge. And I, I, I'm with you on it. I think it's I, the, I, I think what you're doing is crazy. It's I mean, John and John in the lab. So John's been at Aberté for what, about 15 years. So John's what, 52. John still gets some of the best sprints 
for age and weight in the gym. I mean, he does them like three times a week. I mean, he's just mm. been living the Wingates for like 15 years of his life. And we've always just released a sprint protocol free PDF online as well, some of the things that we do. And um, I'm a big believer in them. We, Hannah, we change them up a lot. So our big thing is, is we need 60 seconds of work in a sprint. We can break up. We can do 20 tens. We will offset the recovery ratio depending on where she is in fight camp as well. But when we, she first came to train with me, I said to her, you need to get to love this bike. I said, it's never going to love you back. I said, it doesn't work that way. But you need to learn to love this. And she's like, well, if I can't, I said, well, just love to hate it. I said, it doesn't matter. Because um, that, and the reason we do the bikes rather than all sprints is just purely because we want to take a little bit of, um, we, we don't want to be hammering the body too much, always on the feet. Um, so I like the bike. I think it's easy to set up. The other thing I like about the bike is, is once she dials her settings in on a decent bike, it can always be at that setting, so nothing changes yeah. too much. So I can get the same torque on the leg positions and everything else. Um, we we get interesting data in the lab on the load bike, the Scalibur, because we get foot position and we get power ratios. So yeah. interestingly, we're looking at the NERS data and we're looking at the ratio between muscle and torque. So we're seeing what the ratio between left leg and right leg is in power generation and how that equates to oxygen utilization. So we're getting really nice data on that as well. Um, and the other thing is, is we get really nice data on symmetry. That if it's too wide, we can correct it. Um, and we just get a lot of really super decay rate data, which is really nice. And that's why I like the bike, because even the yeah. walk bike, I can get that fit file and I can break that fit file apart and, and run the data. Sprints, I find treadmill doesn't work too well. Even the curved ones, I don't think people run hard enough. And outdoors, yeah. generally, I find that people don't push as hard. And from the cruelty point of view and the psychological point of view, anyone that's doing bike sessions with us on a walk bike knows that I'm getting their data. Yeah. Because I've accessed it. So they know I'm looking at it. So it forces them to kind of push a little bit harder because they know I'm, I'll phone them up and go, look, you yeah. need to repeat that session because it wasn't good enough. Um, and nobody wants to hear that at six o'clock on a Monday morning. We phone them up going, session wasn't good enough. You need to do it again. Um, so it's a, it's a nice biofeedback look. But I like, I, I just, is the funny thing was, I think boxing and other combat sports did sprints but didn't really realize what they were doing yeah so I, I know as a kid we did a lot of sprints but the coach never knew why we were doing them or, or what it was doing and i always felt growing up that we were fitter when we had the sprint protocols and we used to only ever do them over summer because we could go outside when it came to winter they just disappeared because there was no space in the hall so i think boxing is one of these interesting sports that had a lot of things right but purely by accident Nobody yeah. set out to discover it. And now I think what happened is, is we've lost a lot of the older style stuff because the new fancy things have come in. And yes. I don't think it's actually, and I don't think it's any better. So I think, yeah. you know, so I'm getting one of these strange coaches, like I'm classed now as a legacy coach because of my age. And I sit in these sports science meetings with other boxing coaches. And I'm like very, like I'm very new and very old in the middle, but I can just, just leave it. I just, I just don't want the middle section of training development. I just want the beginning and where we are now, and I think that's the perfect marriage when we marry it up. Like old school, like 50s, 60s, in the 50s, 60s, boxers hitting heavy bags non-stop. There was no focus yeah. pads. Do you mean they were just hitting a heavy bag and running? But a lot yeah. of them are doing sprints. You look at it, you think a lot of them are just doing sprints and then doing all-out sprint sessions on the bag and sparring. Yeah. And probably some, maybe some bodyweight exercises as well. Um, so that's an interesting one because Hannah's routine is predominantly body weight based. It's not, we don't do a massive amount of load. We do some, but we do a lot of quality movement, like proper strict push-ups, making sure it's slow down, hold it, slow back up. I just want good range of motion. I just want to see good stability and control and single leg work. That's that's about it. Don't do any Olympic lifting many of my athletes anymore. What I do do though, is you come across the flywheel system, like the K-box, the eccentric yeah. K-box. Yeah. yeah. I've got one of them. We use that a lot. We use the eccentric overload a lot with athletes that need to maintain weight in lower weight categories. Yeah, yeah. So bantam weights and super weights. So that way we don't do too much hypertrophy and we just get a nice lengthening of the muscle tissue yeah. and we can get some, so we can get still get some very nice metrics and get some nice peak eccentric overload. Um, I'm a big lover of eccentric work just for strength and ligaments and tendons because I think at the end of the day, it probably has more benefit than too much bulk because of the auction cost. And I think uh, a lot of boxing is very explosive, pivoting, especially the lighter weights. There's a lot of lateral movement. There's a lot of pivots, 360 tons. 
So I like them just to have nice kind of uh, tendon and, and, and ligament strength to, to be able to do those movements. Uh, and that's about it, actually. Yeah. Couldn't really sell this program online because there's not much to it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. kind of like quite, it's quite basic. We're very, yeah. do we need to do it? And if so, how do we do it properly? Um, yeah. If we don't need to do it, why are we doing it? You know, no. and the hardest thing for Hannah and the hardest thing for a lot of the other, like Dean Sullivan and all these kids that we had, uh, he, when he was going through his WBC Silver, was telling me he had to train less. Yeah. That was, yeah. for some of these, is like a killer. You're like, what do you mean? I need to train less. You're like, you're training too much. You're not recovering. Yeah. No. And I'm like, but that doesn't mean doing, that doesn't mean doing nothing. It just means take your girlfriend and go for a really nice walk somewhere. Yes. Yes. Enjoy life. Go out, see yeah. things, touch trees, do whatever you want to do. I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, or go play squash or go play tennis or go play, I don't care, you know, but yeah. that was one of the biggest issues was like, you need to train a little bit less. You need to train 52 weeks a year, but it doesn't mean every session has to be like you're killing someone in the gym. Yes. Then, just, uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, that's just because yeah. otherwise you're just, you're just not recovering. So we need the recovery phase as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's one thing, like I, I do see an inherent, like kind of misunderstanding around that is like, what it means to be an effective strength and conditioning session versus what is typical is two different things. Like yeah. I think a 15 minute strength and conditioning session is probably adequate for most fighters. Like if you actually look at the work being done versus what's actually going on and they're just, they're literally hitting the same tempo. They're hitting the same system that they're hitting and training already because their training is this, this gray zone black hole area. And they yeah. go in and strength and conditioning and they just do the same thing. And it's like, I don't think that that's not necessary. I think there is some need for that type of work, but it's like, you know, I'm not saying <clears throat> 50 minutes is the holy grail. I'm just saying, if you look at the actual load that's on most fighters, it's like, you, you probably can't even handle that. You'd probably be better off just not even doing it. But it's like, if you can reduce some of the volume in areas that aren't really benefiting you and use that yeah. volume to... Uh, appropriately apply it to you know sprint training uh proper strength and conditioning it's like that's where you're going to get the bag for your buck like sitting there and doing like 30 minutes of stupid drills before jujitsu because your coach is like you know this is the way we've always done it and we're going to do you know all this yeah, it's like that that's you know it's a waste and i think people don't realize how much of that in their day is going on as a fighter like they spend it just drives me insane like these classes and then because they have to go through these motions of doing these stupid warm ups and these things and waste all this time is they get in the habit of like doing everything half ass like you were talking about a while yeah. ago it's like it used to yeah. drive me insane i would watch fighters throw pretty much 500 strikes in a training session and every single one of them was nonchalantly and i'm like how much time are you actually spending throwing a proper punch a proper kick and it's like very little of your training is actually dedicated to that because you've been like lulled into this check the box because you started off in this place where it's like, Oh, I'm doing something I don't want to do. And then it just carries over and seeps into the next thing. Um, yeah. The yeah. other thing I think you're right on with is the bike is like, I seen this with, 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 uh, with lifting. If you want to maximally express strength, you have to create the safest orthopedic conditions and the least amount of, uh, complexity to do that. Yep. So even putting a pad on the bar, these little things that just create different conditions dramatically change the amount of output. If you're trying to train physiology, you should be trying to whittle down the factors that allow the athlete to actually train that physiology to the maximum. If you put someone on a curved treadmill, they're just not going to be able to do it because there's so much threat and stability that needs to go on. There's so yeah, exactly. much versus a bike you plug them in and they're literally connected to this thing that's super stable. All they have to do is just smash those pedals. Um, but yeah, I'm dude, there's so much stuff that you're talking about. That, <laughs> it's like if funny. I would have ran into you when I was a kid, <laughs> like I, I literally, I don't think people understand how good they got it, like getting to, to work with you. And I think it's, I'm hoping it's, this stuff it's hard though. It's funny because if, if you think go back to what you're saying about 500 strikes yeah, and you can think you're maybe throwing, maybe say 50, 60 quality, so you're maybe throwing about, you know, 450 bad strikes and you're doing that three times a week for 10 years yeah. of your career. The amount of yeah. bad habits you create. Yeah. The other thing is it drives me crazy is all this short pad work, everything's short. 
But yeah. the aim is to go long. It's not to go short unless you're in the close in the clinch position or you're in that nice tight position. So all that stuff, I, I think coaches just don't really think about why are they doing it or, or the position of the length. It drives me nuts, right? It just, yeah. you know, which is why I no longer coach as much as I used to coach, which is why I'm doing this. But but I think you're right. It's, it's kind of funny. It? I think about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu when I did it, you know, it was all bear crawl warm-ups and all these weird things. You'd be completely fatigued before you even rolled. And then you're like, as you know, you're, you're, you're a white or a blue belt, you're just fish for the purples and browns and you're, you're fucked even before you get to that stage. <laughs> and you do five in a roll and you're wondering why yeah. you're getting tapped out and, you know, you get triangled or on a palatad. You're like, well, that doesn't make any sense. It's like, we need to train smarter, more efficiently. But the other thing is, is we need to have load. We need, you know, I, I see this, when people are in the labs and like, the reason we do super maximums is we need that stimulus change because you don't get it often enough elsewhere. Mm-hmm. We need to give it to you. And the argument I get from other sports scientists is, is, but you can't do that all the time. And I'm like, no, but we can do it at least twice a week because it's only 60 seconds of work broken into small, tiny segments. So you can do it. It is achievable. But that's why you see the benefits in lifting when you're doing maximal lifts. There's a reason why the stimulus is so high. So going back to the flywheel, was we were able to do eccentric overload in a very controlled environment. The athletes can do it. And the other thing I like about it is there's no skill to it. Yes. So you can get athletes Simple. through it much quicker, yeah, and safely. And for me, that's that's what it's all in. But when we get other athletes come in, and a lot of times they're kind of like, oh, you don't do back squat and you don't do zerkas, you're not doing... And I'm like, no. I'm like, why would I spend so much time trying to teach you to back squat when you're never actually going to go that small in movement? You're yeah. not single leg takedown. You're not doing doubles. You're not having to shoot in. I said it's a very small mini squat position. So theoretically, there's, why don't we do quarter squats? Yeah. So I'll just put safety spotters on. I'll just go nice weight. All I want to do is back squat until we touch the safety spotters, explode back up. That's it. Third range of motion. Just give it to me. Bingo. Done. Yeah. Because I just don't think you have to do a lot of it. I, I think it is, it is where it is. And it's like, I just kind of hope things will get better. Hopefully, um, <laughs> yeah. I can yeah. live in hope. <laughs> yeah, man, you you literally are leading the charge, though. I think like I'm not trying to like you know pit pit you against anyone here, but some of the stuff I see of the people out there that are considered like strength and conditioning specialists or sports scientists for for fighting combat sports, it's like what they're doing and what you're doing is two completely different worlds. So I'm really hoping that you know this stuff starts catching on and people hear what you're saying like this is why i wanted to have you on the show is because i wanted people to hear the dramatic um departure from what is normally done and what's going on in here uh with with you guys is yeah so i think there's a i think there's a higher chance that a change may happen in your end of the world versus my end of the world um (laughs) so i'm kind of i'm hopeful i'm hoping that we might be over in florida for a couple of weeks doing some sessions over there I just think the UK, especially boxing, is it's very, very rigid in its approach. Yeah. Um, you've got a couple of key players that have made a name for themselves, not all the S&C. Some of it's good, some of it's really bad. Yeah. But there's no... I think sports science over here is still pretty trapped in old-school VO2 max testing. I don't think there's any... Yeah. You know, if you think about it, like... I think we're the only university in Scotland that's actually using Moxie for applied science. Yeah. A lot of universities in England are using the Portamon system. Uh, and I've had discussions with, with Roger over this, you know, because a couple of unis are like, oh, Portamon's got much better clinical validity. And I don't think it has. I don't think it's got any better validity than what actually Moxie has. But even those units with the Portamon are not really using it for applied. It's still very much the same old style of papers that are coming out. I think... It's going to take a few people to break away from the mold and go, it may happen when we get our paper out later this year, which will be looking at all the different physiological responses with nerves. I, I'm kind of hoping then people may go, let's do more applied science and get some papers where we can show actually how we use it actually in the field. Because I, I don't know anyone else that's really using it for combat sports the way we're using it. There's a few people mm-hmm. using it, but nobody's really... I think people are obsessed with this idea of the muscle should desaturate under 20%. Yeah, and yeah, float around yeah. right which i'm not we're not into that at all we are yeah. that slope exchange yeah that's that's yeah. where it all lies for us it's that downward slope and that resaturation slope and the correlation between the two of them as rounds progress 
and we look at those linear correlations, that's that's where we see you get an idea of how good is your localized muscular function. That's and then there's other bigger there's a bigger question is like how much does heat affect it? You know, because a lot of these boxers, you train them, they have a television fight, you go under the lights, and it's just like it's like being in a sauna, and they've never trained for that. So you start to see all the dehydration kick in much sooner. You yeah. start to see drop off in performance. One of the big things we're looking at fairly soon is is using nerves in those type of environments to see what the difference is in and out of those environments on performance. So we'll have them spar in that environment and spar out that side environment, and we'll correlate it and see we'll have very similar sparring partners each time so that we can see what the change is and whether heat has a detrimental effect and skeletal muscle oxygen uptake. So there's an exciting yeah. world of PhD opportunities at Aberdeen University <laughs> for people that want a PhD because <laughs> we're doing loads of that type of stuff. So, yeah. so hopefully it'll change. And the other thing is, is, I think, I kind of wonder how far can we push the cycling uh, and everything else with Moxie and NERS if we reached the end. Gem's doing some pretty cool stuff. I'm kind of like, maybe we're just only scratching at the surface of that as well. Yeah, I mean, maybe... You know, so I think this is an exciting time, especially for the youngsters, because yeah. I'm closer down yeah. the end of the runway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I'm with you on that. I think we're only scratching the surface. Like, I think some of the stuff that Phil Batterson published with his stuff, yeah, that stuff hasn't even been re repeated yet. Like, that that stuff hasn't been re reinvestigated yet. So I think we're just scratching the surface, especially with the repeated cuff pressures and all this stuff. Like, there's so much to, to glean out of, out of Nears. Listen, like we've already smashed for two hours. I'm gonna have you wow. back on again because we never even we never even I literally sent Andrew a huge list of questions <laughs> and topics that we're gonna go over. That's right. We might have hit like two of them, if that. Uh, you know, and it was great. Like I, I this is the way I'd rather do it because I feel if you you know you rush and you try to get through everything, there's a lot of nuance miss. And I think yeah, that's yeah. where everything is at is in the nuance. So I'm glad we did it this way, but I'll be sure to get you back on again. No, um, excellent. Yeah, so where can where can people find you and where can people find the stuff that you're putting out? Um so I'm kind of like hidden. Um so Instagram. I don't know my, so this is how bad it is. I don't even know what my Instagram is. <laughs> uh the Twitter is Andrew Usher, I think Instagram maybe the Andrew Usher. Yeah. Um and Abertay University, we're starting to put some things out on that. None of the research will come out until it goes through peer review and everything else and goes through the final write-ups and then it'll get published in the usual journals. I'll make that available with Facebook. I'm not really on that too much, but it tends to just be Instagram. I am trying to increase my profile. Uh, I'm not mm -hmm. big on the socials, though. I'm not massive at it. Strangely, my wife has a bigger following on Twitter than I have, which is interesting <laughs> uh, because she's a doctor probably. So the Androsher on Instagram, and I think it's just Androsher on Twitter. I had to think yeah. about that there. That's I'll how like cool Oh, cool that is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't really post a huge amount. Um yeah. Yeah, you don't post a massive amount either. No, I don't. I like I didn't have social media for like close to the last seven, eight years or something like that. I just got it back because I'm like, oh, I gotta, you gotta I gotta it. play somewhat of the game. I gotta pretend to be in it. But um yeah. Yeah, I'm the same. I'm trying now because the university is quite proactive and they're very much like we need to start disseminating all this stuff and get it out there yeah so it's kind of like okay um but i think it's like double-edged sword i think it's kind of uh yeah I'm, I'm forced to read a lot of other posts that i normally would be like oh, what the fuck um <laughs> so, <I know. laughs> so, <laughs> it, draws, it sucks you into all this like oh and you spend time like wasting your thought into uh, I hear occasionally you. though I, I occasionally you know like phil and all these people sometimes post up really cool papers though so sometimes yeah. it's something i've yeah. missed and I'll be like hunting that paper down. So, um, yeah. so oh, yeah, I, so, I mean, there, there is a plus, but yeah, that that's it. Um, yeah. yeah, my little corner of the web. Yeah. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, really appreciate Andrew giving up his time today. And and I hope you guys take a lot from this and, and spread the message. Um, whether you're in whatever endurance sport or fighting or boxing or whatever it is. And uh, we'll catch you later. <laughs>